Okay, Francis, we're recording. Francis, we can't hear you. I just really, Pat was, uh, I looked at the video. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Again, uh, my name is Francis Curtis, and I am the chair of the Quality of Work Life Subcommittee on um, Health and Human Services. And with the onset of uh, our wonderful situation here, the pandemic of COVID, we decided to uh, offer occasional presentations and updates regarding everything that involves COVID and how it's affecting our lives in the community board and in the world. So tonight is uh, our first presentation and uh, you should look forward to more in the future by looking at the agenda for the quality of work life committee, then you will see uh, we will have a subcommittee meeting prior to the general meeting, which is what we're gonna do today. And today we have the honor of having Dr. Rinkla Gupta from um, Lower Manhattan Hospital, who is going to do a presentation on understanding uh, COVID and how, and yeah, understanding COVID. And after the, her presentation, if you uh, could just raise your hand and she'll be more than happy to take uh, any questions you may have after that. Um, and Francis, if I may just cut in one second, um, for all those yes. who are joining us for our quality of life committee meeting that will be following directly after this meeting. So just stay on this channel. You don't need to sign out to a different link. This will be the same place. So just stay with us if you're here for the quality of life meeting as well. But this is great information. So definitely listen for, to this. And this is uh, Dr. Renka Gupta. She's the Associate Professor of Clinical Medicine at Weill Cornell Medicine and the Chief of Medicine at New York Presbyterian Lower Manhattan Hospital. And she's gonna give us COVID-19 vaccine overview presentation. Dr. Gupta. Dr. Gupta, I think you are mute. You had to unmute yourself. I'm so sorry. I still haven't gotten used to it, you know. This <laughs> is... Thank you so much, Francis, for giving us such a beautiful introduction. It's an honor to be able to present and talk to the community about the vaccine and the COVID and the pandemic that we are all going through. So thank you so much. Chuman will help me run the slides and I can share what we have for all of you. So this is what we were just suggesting. We will be talking about COVID-19 vaccine overview. What we'll be going through a quick roadmap is what is COVID-19? Why do we need to get vaccinated? And how do these vaccines work? Will these vaccines really protect me? And are they safe? The different types of vaccines and how come they became available so quickly? Are there any safety concerns regarding that? What about the allergic reactions, the pregnancy and the breastfeeding? And last but not the least, the confidence that the vaccine confidence starts with each and every one of us, the importance of the information, communication and the transparency. So this will be the brief roadmap that we'll run through our slides. Now, what is COVID-19, first of all? So COVID-19 is a SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the virus. And COVID-19 is the name of the illness that this particular SARS-CoV-2 causes. What is the transmission? Droplet transmission. What do you mean by that? When you cough or you sneeze, you can spread these tiny droplets of saliva and mucus. And then what happens? Then it happens as an airborne transmission. What do you mean by that? 
tiny particles from your coughing and sneezing are suspended in the air for longer and they travel much farther down. And this is the size of the particle is less than five microns. Next one. Now the question is, why should I get vaccinated, right? COVID-19 can have serious life-threatening complications. And there is no way to know how COVID-19 will affect you. New COVID-19 illness can present with any of these symptoms, congestion, runny nose, fever, chills, cough, tiredness, gastrointestinal symptoms like diarrhea, vomitings, headaches, loss of taste and smell, sore throat, muscle or body aches. People can have longer duration of symptoms or complications from COVID-19, which are still, which we are still learning about, but they can affect, as I mentioned, any organ of your body, heart, lungs, GI, nervous system, kidneys. All COVID-19 vaccines currently available in the United States have been shown to be highly effective in preventing COVID-19. And what the latest data that we have, currently 1.8 million people have been hospitalized with COVID-19 in the United States. And COVID-19 has resulted in over 530,000 deaths nationwide. Next one, please. Why should I, again, the question is, why should I get vaccinated? Simple answer, protect yourself. As we said, right, it can affect your heart. It can make your heart go bigger. You can develop heart failure symptoms where it stops functioning. You can have worsening kidney functions, increased blood clots in your body, and the brain fog, slowing, causing weakness, paralysis, parast parasthesias, tingling or numbing, and affects your lung, your pulmonary system, difficulty breathing, permanent long-term damage, causing scarring of your lungs, and complications from intubation, the advanced airway, Reinfections can occur. Several case reports in the United States and other countries, some with worse symptoms, other with less. Next one. The vaccines are 95% effective in stopping the COVID-19 disease for people with symptoms. More work is underway to learn more about how it works on people without symptoms. But our best evidence is that getting vaccinated can help protect people around us, particularly people at increased risk for severe illness from COVID-19. Stopping a pandemic requires using all the tools we have available. As experts learn more about how COVID-19 vaccination may help reduce the spread of the disease in the communities, the CDC will continue to update the recommendations to protect the communities using the latest science. Next one. The next, again, the same question. Why should I get vaccinated? We want to end the pandemic. Right. Let's go back in the history and just see when smallpox started, diphtheria, measles, mumps, polio, pertussis. What happened? Look at the case reports in 2019 versus when we were giving, when the vaccination started, look at the percentage decrease. Everything was more than 90% decreased. But the coronavirus in the, United, in the United States currently, how many cases do we have? more than 29.3 million cases. And how many deaths? More than 530,000 deaths. Next one. How do I know that the vaccines work and are safe? The vaccine, each vaccine has been tested in tens of thousands of people. 
100 plus million people have had a COVID-19 vaccine in the United States. And vaccines are held to the same safety standards and testing phases like all other vaccines. Next one. Let me know, please, if I'm too fast, I can definitely slow down. So please guide me through the process. Thank you. All the vaccines are very safe and effective at preventing COVID-19. All the current vaccines are between 80 to 95% effective at preventing severe diseases. No significant safety concerns have been identified with mild side effects, which I'll go over. Vaccines cannot give someone COVID-19. Next one. How do vaccines work? A vaccine works by showing your immune system what a piece of coronavirus looks like. Essentially a mugshot of the coronavirus. And if then the real coronavirus tries to enter your body, it will be recognized and be attacked by the immune cells and the antibodies. So just reviewing the vaccine, the messenger RNA, it's like an instruction manual on how to make the spike protein on your SARS-CoV-2 virus. Our cells make copies of that protein and teach our immune system to make antibodies and immune cells against that virus, the SARS-CoV-2. Examples of this are Moderna and Pfizer. So this is the one that I was talking to you about. These vaccines use DNA instead of messenger RNA and tell your cells how to make copies of the spike protein found on the SARS-CoV-2. Instead of being packaged in a fat, the DNA is inside an, another virus called the adenovirus. And I'm sure majority of us might know that adenovirus normally causes common cold, but has been inactivated, so it does not cause the cold, but delivers the information about the SARS-CoV-2. This helps it get the attention of the immune system. And the example of the DNA vaccinations that we have are Johnson & Johnson, and AstraZeneca. Next slide. So this is what um, I just mentioned about the mRNA vaccine, the two that we have in the United States. One is Pfizer. Two doses are given, 21 days apart, and it is approved for 16 and above. 36,621 people have been tested and the efficacy, the protection against COVID-19 infection and symptoms is 95%. On the other hand, we have Moderna, two doses, four weeks apart, 28 days apart. This is approved for 18 and above, and 30,000 people have been tested. Again, the protection against COVID-19, very comparable, 94.5%. Next one. Now, the one that we are talking about is Johnson & Johnson, the DNA vaccine. One dose, currently, the two doses are also understudied. 18 and above, 44,325 people have been, vaccine, have been tested. 72% protection against moderate to severe COVID-19 disease in the United States and 85% against severe disease. Next one. The question that I get from many of um, my patients and the community is, how was this vaccine created so quickly? So clinical trial phases always overlap. They were overlapped. 
manufacturing began while the clinical trials were still underway. FDA and CDC are prioritizing review and authorization of COVID-19 vaccines. Thousands of diverse people volunteered. So this was what we are trying to say is everything was done in parallel. It was not that one phase gets done, then the next got picked up. Everything was getting done side by side because we really wanted to get it out there and make sure it met the safety standards as well. Now, again, monitoring safety after the vaccine is approved. There is a strong post approval monitoring system through four CDC systems, which includes vaccine adverse event reporting system, VARS, that how they call it, and the vSAFE app. Safety data across all of the systems are analyzed and reported each week. What about the new strains? So when the coronavirus makes copies of itself, it sometimes makes copying errors and that is called a mutation. Okay, sometimes these mutations change the way the virus behaves. Like how easy it is to spread to other people and how much it can avoid an immune response from your body trying to fight it off. It's like a family tree. When a group of viruses share a set of mutations, that change the way they behave, it is called a strain. And if epidemics continue, viruses spread and they mutate, forming strains. Hence, vaccination is a best tool to stop these mutations and the new strains. Vaccines help protect us against these new strains, but may not be as effective but vaccines are still recommended. The current three top, uh, back, uh, Chuman. The current three top um, strains that we are talking seeing are the UK variant, the South African variant, the Brazilian or the Japanese variant. That's what we are seeing more right now. Next one. So I think what is, I do get these very common questions, which I thought I'll address it right here. I have already been infected with COVID-19 and have COVID-19 antibodies. Should I still get vaccinated? And the answer is yes, because some people have become reinfected and the vaccines might provide better protection. Another question that we commonly get if I get vaccinated, do I still need to wear a mask and practice social distancing? Again, the answer is yes. And why? Because at this time, we do not know if the vaccine prevents all infections. And it is possible that you could still spread it to others. How long will the protection last? We don't know that yet, but studies are ongoing to answer this particular question. Next one. What about allergic reactions? So everyone should stay in the hospital or the clinic for 15 minutes in case you might be allergic to something in the vaccine. Before getting vaccinated, be very sure to document the known allergies on your pre-vaccine checklist. If you have had a serious allergic reaction to something other than the vaccine, you should stay in that area around for 30 minutes after your vaccine. And if you are allergic to something in the vaccine, you should not get vaccinated and consult with your doctor. And more so, the team is already there, right? So be very comfortable discussing your concerns with the vaccination team. The other question that we get very commonly is what about pregnancy and breastfeeding? So pregnant women who get COVID-19 are at greater risk of being hospitalized, have an increased risk of death, and even a greater risk if they have another clinical or chronic condition. 
vaccine is recommended by the American um, Society of OBGYN for those planning to become pregnant to protect against COVID-19 or during pregnancy. If you are breastfeeding, you should go ahead and get the vaccine. There is no way for the vaccine to get into the breast milk or affect the baby. You should not stop breastfeeding to get the vaccine. And the resources to make the vaccination appointment, there are two right now, New York State Vaccination Hotline and the NYC COVID-19 Vaccination Hotline. It will take time for everyone to be vaccinated, but we are working towards it. In the meantime, we must all keep doing what we know works. Wear a mask, wash your hands, watch your distance. So basically it's W cube, wear, wash, watch. Okay. Importance of communication, the transparency and the trust the vaccine confidence, I cannot stress this enough, starts with each and every one of you. Please choose to get vaccinated yourself. Start these conversations early on and engage in effective conversations and be prepared for questions. Building confidence in COVID-19 vaccines amongst your patients, the very lot of updates and guidelines on the CDC website. So if anyone is interested, please go ahead and read more about it. And I think that's pretty much where I am. I'll take any questions. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Gupta. This is the second time I've seen this presentation and I'm still <laughs> learning a lot. <laughs> I'm so thank glad. Thank you very much. We, we have a, a few minutes for a few questions. Sure. And I see the hands over here. Anybody else have a hand, please put it up. I will start at the top of the list with uh, Justine. Could you please unmute yourself? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you, Fran. Thank you, um, Dr. Gupta, for, for the presentation. It was great. Um, I have a question for you about what is the, what is the CDC? If you could help distill all the information out, say you're vaccinated, then what? How do you um, function or interact with people who number one, if you can answer this, are vaccinated, and then people who are not vaccinated? What's safe? Ish. I mean, you know, what's safe? So, <laughs> wow. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to figure it out. What do I tell my kids? What do I tell my mom? What do I tell this? You know, there's people, I don't know what to do and nobody knows what to do. So that's why I'm asking. Uh, great. Nobody knows. And I fall in that category of nobody also, honestly, but how I practice and how I'm vaccinated. My family is, my mom is vaccinated. When we are all together, we are together. But if I am with someone else, right, I keep my mask on. Even if I'm sitting together, I do keep my mask on if I am with someone who doesn't live in my household. And the reason is I am vaccinated, right? CDC also says that if you are vaccinated and you have your family members who are vaccinated, my understanding is CDC says you can have your mask down and sit and in a group of 10 is that number, golden number, which they say you could be okay. But on the other hand, being a healthcare provider, I don't have that luxury. I always have to have that ma mask on, right? Obviously, if you're having dinner with your family, you can't have the mask on. I mean, you can make a hole in your mask and keep feeding yourself. But obviously, you'll put your mask down, right? So I think use your judgment if you're all well vaccinated and you are in a group of your own immediate family, a group of reasonable number of eight to 10, right? No one sick with cough, cold or any of those symptoms. I would say it's reasonable to sit together and have a quick dinner or lunch or, you know, just to see each other. But if you're not doing any of that and you don't live in the same household, it gets tricky. So you basically then stay away, basically keep keep up all the separation 
at this, which is which is fine. But that's what you're saying is you got to keep keep vigilant, vigilant, vigilant is the word. Be very vigilant, vigilant and yes, exact. Yeah. Be very digital, diligent and vigilant about it. <laughs> <laughs> that does not mean that you don't, you should not meet your family, right? I think it's, they need to see you, right? You need to see your loved ones. And if they are all vaccinated, you know what? It's okay. As long as A, B, C, D are all checked. Am I answering it appropriately? Does that help? I'm trying. Okay. <laughs> yes, thank you. Oh, sorry. Okay, uh, Pat, Pat Moore, please unmute yeah. Jimmy. Just Thank you, Dr. Gupta, oh. for that yes. wonderful presentation. Oh. So my question is about the, uh, the virulence, are they called? The, uh, the other new strains? Yes. So have we seen a lot of them in New York? And should we be, <laughs> for lack of a better, <laughs> should we be frightened? I mean, is there going to be a new uptick in cases with these new virulent strains? Oh, geez, Pat, that is, I have to wear my, open up my third eye now. Uh, <laughs> let me think of <laughs> Well, first of all, I guess, have you seen a lot of cases in New York? Um, in the immediate surrounding area? I will not see a lot, <laughs> but yes, I have. I have seen a few cases, especially in the bigger campuses at Cornell and Columbia, a few. Absolutely, yes. Is that a very big number right now? No, but it's out there. And uh, that's why I say CDC is saying I am worried of opening up these indoor movie theaters, indoor dining. It worries me a little bit. Honestly, I'm being a little candid about it. But as I said, be diligent, be vigilant, and use your judgment, but oh, the strains are out there. Well, one thing, everybody, my mother and I, my 92 year old mom and I got our second Pfizer vaccine today. So yay. And oh, good, two, you're ready for hugs. At, yeah, at our <laughs> age, we're not going to any movie theater or indoor gym or anything for quite a while. So if you've seen it on the campuses, that means that there are young people that have it. Am I just making an assumption, but I, so in the hospital surroundings, like, right. I work in the hospital setting. I have not yet seen young people. And I'll also give us saying by there is a little bit of a dip down in the COVID cases. Um, and the cases that we see, yes, the strains are the virulence is out there, but we are also seeing a number of other patients, not COVID related who did not seek medical attention, stayed back home because of scare or whatever, could not reach out with their primary folks. And we are seeing a bunch of those patients also okay. with their chronic medical conditions now becoming acute. Right. Yes. Right. So. Okay. Like you said, we'll stay vigilant and, and diligent. Thank you. Yes, please no. do so. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Okay. Um, Mitchell? Yeah, Please my question is, um, you hear me now? Yes, Mitchell. Yes. Totally unimportant. I know Gupta is a common name. Uh, any relation to Dr. Sanjay? Just curious. <laughs> I don't want to answer <laughs> no, this on did. this call. The reason is because uh, it. I was told it goes on YouTube. I don't want to joke about it. Oh, I'm it, sorry. I, I wasn't <laughs> even thinking about anything. It was no problem. I understand. I, it was no, just... no, 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 I'm kidding. No, absolutely not. It's a very, very common last name. So right. it's like, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Smith, like Hernandez. It means governor or protector, I, I read in, in Hindi. Really? I, go I Googled it before, oh, okay. and that's what it said. Oh, thank you so much. I never knew that. Thank you. It even makes me feel even better now. Thanks, Mitch. You're welcome. Okay, so we have some international news now. Uh, <laughs> okay, I don't, I don't see any more hands, and it is time for us to move on to the next meeting. So, Dr. Gupta, thank you so much for a brilliant and very informative presentation. And I'm sure people will have more questions after everything shuts down. But thank you again. And you and your family stay healthy, stay blessed, and stay happy.
Thank, Thank you, you so much. It's my pleasure and an honor. And if anyone needs, has questions, please reach out to us. We are more than happy to address it. Thank you, guys. Please be safe. Go Thank from you your too. arms if you all are vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Francis. Thank you, Chido. Francis, uh, this is Lucian. I'm, I'm going to post the link to the eight facts about COVID-19 uh, on the chat. So everyone who's monitoring the chat, okay. please look out for that link um, so you can see that fact sheet that uh, was so graciously provided to us. Um, also, Francis, uh, Pauline Ferranti is joining us from the City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Um, she may have some um, very timely updates about the city's um, uh, work. Hi, everyone. Uh, minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, right, Pauline. How are you? Good. How are Pauline? you all? Yes. Pauline's an old friend. Anytime she needs. <laughs> yes, I will just go really quickly. So we are at we have over. Zero. We have um, administered over two million first doses um, of Moderna and Pfizer, and we are at over three million dose one and two. So that's pretty exciting. Um, administered throughout New York City, which is great. Um, there are now um, pharmacies are now allowed to administer the vaccines to folks 60 and older and also pre pre K to 12 um, <laughs> teachers and child care workers and people with underlying health conditions. So this is improving access points for people to be able to um, gain access to the vaccine, which is also very exciting. And also Moderna is now, um, they have their first pediatric enrollment um, for trials. So that's all really exciting news. And of course, everyone knows about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine that received um, the FDA emergency use authorization. This is a game changer for folks who are homebound. Um, and now there is an ability to bring the vaccination to people directly instead of having um, folks need to travel out. So um, if you are a homebound senior and you are in, in need of a homebound vaccination, there is an interest form online. Um, if you fill that out or if your caretaker fills that out on your behalf, you will be reached out by a city employee, um, someone from the health department or the vaccine command center, just to verify some details. Um, that doesn't guarantee um, a scheduled appointment right away but it is to get you on the list so that once more doses of the J&J &J vaccine become available, they know that you are interested, you are eligible, and you will be able to receive it um, in your home. So those are all of my major updates. Happy to take any questions. I have, a, I have something. Are there any that, questions for Pauline? And yeah, I have something that's related. And, and Lucian, I don't know if... Uh, Kathleen Moore is in uh, with the callers, um, and it's possible to put her on. Who is she? What's her name? Kathleen Moore. If she I isn't there, just let me. I've unmuted Kathleen. I'm sorry. Oh, I see her. Yeah, her hand is up too. Kathleen, you you're unmuted. You can speak. Yeah, Kathleen, okay. can you just quickly tell Pauline what happened with in your case? Yes. Uh, one of our problems is. Uh, or what I'm I'm afraid of is the spread of COVID and how quickly and easily it can be spread. I live in a building, as does Pat, where we have a small elevator corridor. We only have 12 floors. There are only 24 tenants, and you cannot avoid um, mingling your aerosols when you're on the elevator or in the hallway. Um, we have a a group of young people who live across the street from me, across the hall from me, who are having parties every weekend. They are, they are Ooh. by the sound of them, quite large, at, at least 10 people, probably 20 to 40. And um, they have the, all these people coming in and pushing through the elevators and, and um, breathing on us, breathing on our atmosphere. My husband <laughs> nearly died of COVID. And I also had it. He was taken to the hospital twice. And I can't say that they caused it, but I can't say that they didn't. I've called the police. I've called 311. 311 will take noise uh, complaints, but they will not take any COVID complaints. So the noise people know that they are taking uh, noise complaints rather than COVID. The police have arrived at the doorways of these people across the hall twice already since January. The last time was Saturday. Um, they arrived at like um, about a quarter to one, 
they left, they, they knocked on the door. They, they tell me that all they can do is say, be quiet, be, you know, be whatever, but they can't go into the apartment and they can't tell them that they're uh, spreading COVID. Um, so the police left and five minutes later, the party was roaring again. I've, I, I've talked to our, our police precinct um, and they're trying to help. They think that the only, the only thing they can do next is to, 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 to have a sheriff's raid on this apartment. They're nice young people. I don't want to see them have a sheriff's raid, but yeah, I do but want them to be safe. I want right. this building to be safe. How can we go forward from here? We can't be the only building where we can't figure out how to keep ourselves safe from COVID neighbors. And so sure, this is, I mean, this is a really difficult situation that you're in, and I feel very sad and sorry that your neighbors are seemingly very inconsiderate. Um, the unfortunate part of this is that, you know, it's happening in a private residence and the guidelines are, you know, suggestions and they're not totally enforceable by law in someone's private home. Like if this was a business, then I could call, right. you know, the SLA and the state and they would be shut down, you know, pretty much immediately for breaking all of these social distancing violations. Um, but because this is happening in a private residence, that's a little bit more difficult for us to be able to have any teeth in sort of, you know, enforcement. What I could recommend really is just for for the building to maybe is there signage in the building can management talk oh, yeah. to these folks like is there any yeah. other way for intervention to occur so that they can really fully understand you know the anxiety uh -huh. that they're causing their neighbors i think you know in this case it just seems like they really need a stern talking to from from right. management they've had that well, and they don't okay signage in the building. But Pat, shows. this is something that should be brought up at the, the um the, and we will uh, yeah the, the borough task yeah task the borough task task president's task, task force. You have to call the sheriff. I don't know why everybody's so worried about these young unions if the police well, Susan, that's the next thing that's that the first precinct has that's said. That's what they're they're recommending. Yeah. Um yeah we'll take this really, offline. Everyone but, is stepping in including the, sorry. the management building. Sorry. Yeah, and so I, I think this is also just, you know, another recommendation for folks to go and get your vaccinations now that the eligibility has expanded and access points have been expanded. I think this is, you know, just to take more um, in, in, proactive approach to your own health to make sure you feel safe within your own building. It's unfortunate that other people's behavior is really impacting your life, um, you know, but so anything that you can do personally to make yourself feel much safer, I highly encourage. And so I'm hoping that, you know, if you haven't received your vaccination yet, that you are able to do so soon. You are considered fully vaccinated two weeks after your second dose of Pfizer and Moderna, and you are considered fully vaccinated after two weeks of receiving your Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So, you know, the sooner more people get vaccinated, the better, but we really do need to get better messaging out, especially among young adults that, you know, we're not out of this yet, and they really do need to take more um, serious precautions, especially around, you know, people who are seniors and you share same, you know, public space. I think it's just more messaging on our end that probably needs to take place. Um, and we really do advise against gatherings, even if you are vaccinated. So we encourage people to continue wearing your face coverings indoors and everywhere you are around other folks. Um, okay. And to limit these gatherings, and I, I'm just, I feel really sad that this is happening to you. You know, Pauline, you and I, we can have a conversation offline, but because I do want to push this further, because I know there are other buildings that are experiencing the same problem, and it's yeah. public space. If they could fly up to the window and not use our public space, it's fine. But anyway, we've got to move on. So if there okay. are questions, yeah, thank you. Uh, oh. It was lovely oh, seeing Pat, you all. Are you taking over the meeting? Hey, now? Pat. Oh, Pat, I'm sorry. I had one question for her, if you don't mind. Sure. That's Tammy. Hi, hi, Pauline. Hi, Tammy. Nice to see you. Um, can you talk just for a brief second about the role that um, your agency is playing with the choices for school capacity in New York City? 
because we hear a lot of, well, it doesn't, you know, we have to have approval from the Department of Health. We have to have the approval from here. We have to have approval from there. There are uh, enormous groups of people who are looking to have schools open with a three foot capacity. There are others who are saying, we're never gonna get there. And all that we hear from the Department of Education is it's really about the Department of Health's rule. Yeah, I think that a lot of the guidance needs to be worked out between, you know, our agency, the state, the DOE, the teachers union, a lot of people are sort of in these conversations and have a lot of, you know, opinions and suggestions. And so everything with regards to schools are sort of being managed, you know, on the mayoral level and with our agency, of course, and with the DOE. So um, I can go back and see if there are any updates in terms of what is is being discussed and how soon people will know. But at this point, I don't have any information about capacity in schools. And I think I want to know is what role the mayor's office is playing in this. I mean, I'm I'm pretty sure the mayor's office is taking the lead role um, in terms of negotiations with the state and also with the DOE and the teachers union. So I think, you know, in general, DOE just we we try to issue guidelines that are in accordance with the CDC, the state and other federal partners and agencies. But um, when it comes to schools, particularly, you know, there are a lot of other agencies and, and, and interests in mind. And so we, we, I think, you know, I believe that City Hall takes the lead on this because it's, it involves multiple agencies. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And thank you for coming. No problem. Last question, it's Diane Stein. Um, I'm, hi. Um, Thank you for for your presentation. Um, I just wanted to know about the homebound program. Um, what if somebody's homebound and they don't have access to a, a computer to fill out the the online form? Is there a phone number or something that they can call? Yeah, so I believe they can call the vaccine hotline as well. Um, but what I would recommend is that they reach out to DIFTA um, because DIFTA, so Department for the Aging, is actually part of this rollout of homebound vaccinations. So if you are already within the DIFTA um, system, it makes it much easier. They do calls directly to every one of their members. Um, so, so, you know, having folks sign up to be part of the DIFTA network would be really um, encouraged as well. Um, but the form that is online is you can fill it out on behalf of someone. So if there's a nonprofit organization, if there's a church, if you know personally of someone who is in need of a homebound vaccination, reach out to them, ask them if they are interested in having you fill it out on their behalf. Um, that is an option on this form. So we do know that there are a lot of seniors who maybe through language barrier or maybe through just, you know, lack of, of um, technology can't fill out this form on their own. And so that's an option um, on the phone to have a caregiver or someone fill it out on their behalf. Francis. Oh, you're, you're muted. Francis, we have uh, one question from the attendees, Don Lee from Homecrest Community Services and Lisa Dickinson. I see uh, Homecrest Community Services. Hi. Hello. Uh, yeah. Hi there. Thank you for um, for for allowing me to join tonight's uh, meeting. Uh, my name is Don Lee. So I'm also from Homecrest Community Services. I'm a resident in Battery Park City, and uh, grew up in Chinatown. So my comment tonight is. Um, I think on the agenda is about the Asian hate crime and public safety. Uh, I just want to share with yet. you what's happening. Uh, you think, well, um, sh can I comment now or should I wait? Oh, uh, no, could you please hold that for a second? We're finishing up the first part of the meeting and you'll have plenty got of time. Understood. About Sorry that. about that. I'll, I'll come okay. back. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Lisa Dickinson, is it regarding uh, COVID? Or is it regarding the second part of the agenda? Lisa? Lisa, you're unmuted.
Okay, Francis, I yeah. can move on. Sorry, so sorry. I'm all okay. now. I'm so sorry, Francis. I was on mute. Um, my question is very quick. Uh, my question is, uh, at what point will the uh, homeless people that are in the hotels be vaccinated so that they can return safely to um, to shelters or wherever they were before they ended up in hotels? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the, the Department of Homeless Services actually has a vaccine rollout plan that they have um, um, conducted throughout this when when folks have become el eligible. So when their staff and when their um, clients have become eligible, I believe they have one hub in Manhattan where folks go um, to get vaccinated. And I believe that program has been ongoing. So currently anyone in congregate setting, including homeless shelters, and I, I'm assuming these temporary homeless, ho um, a temporary hotel sh uh, shelters are eligible to receive the vaccine. And so DHS has been working really hard with their clients to get them vaccinated. Terrific, thank you. Sure, and I just wanted to underscore Don Lee, who's a leader in the community. I grew up in Chinatown as well, born and raised. So I really want to thank Community Board One for putting um, the Asian hate crimes topic on the agenda. It really hits home um, for me. So I, I really appreciate that this is being discussed. So thank you all so much. Pauline, you wanna stay? Oh, thank I you. Am. Actually, okay. I have one okay. question for thank Pauline you. and a comment for, um, for uh, I th think Rosa? Kathleen Moore. Oh wait, can um, I close sorry, this out? Rosa. Hello. Wait, wait, Rosa has a comment. Oh, I just had a quick question regarding the COVID. Uh, you touched on the fact that children are getting tested now for the vaccinations. Do you anticipate? Do you have like a timeline for when you imagine that there would be vaccines available for people younger than eighteen years of age? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I don't have a specific timeline timeline right now. I do know that mm -hmm. Pfizer had clinical trials happening for people 12 and up, and I believe with Moderna, it's from six months and older. Um, but I do not know exactly when those clinical trials will be completed and when they would potentially receive authorization for use. I don't have that information. Okay, thank uh, you. Um, sure. And then for Kathleen Moore, I just want to say that I know that for for my building specifically, um, with uh, COVID happening, we basically had our management shut down um, people from outside of the building coming in. And then once we started to slowly reopen, um, as we learned more about how the virus worked and what the safety implications were of having visitors, then we also instituted, you know, a uh, owner or, or resident responsibility for any visitors that they had come and visit. And if it fell outside of the guidelines, there were steep fines related to that. So you may want to look at working with your management agency to- we, Rosa, we're a rental building and unfortunately <laughs> our management agency, our you know, company is not responsive. And so- Oh, I see. But thanks for the suggestions. We're gonna try to take it higher, you know, we'll see. Okay. Thank well, you, Can Rosa. I close out? Yeah, you Just can close out. Madame. Give me two seconds to close out. Uh, thank you very much for coming to that part of the meeting and uh, the COVID part of the meeting. And we will be having another presentation on Monday um, March 29th, I will be getting a flyer out shortly and it'll be a more in depth intro to viruses and, and vaccines. But, uh, again, I want to thank Dr. Gupta and she said that if there were any other questions that came up after she left, she would, she would look into them and I will be able to present the response that, uh, was just asked about the rollout for the age differences. Cause I know the ages have been changing, but again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pat. We went over, but it's a good thing. Okay. So, good evening, everyone. I'm Pat Moore. I'm the chair of the Quality of Life Committee. Is Mariama here? Mariama James is co chair. And um, welcome. Thank you for coming out tonight. We have a very serious topic to discuss uh, with bias and hate crimes taking place against the Asian community. And we all know what happened last night in, in Atlanta. So I know that we have Captain, I thought we had Captain uh, Lou here, but we have instead Captain, let's see, I'm missing Captain the name. Jackson Chang was on and I'm looking. Uh, Officer okay. Nelson is, can you I see if that's uh, Officer who Chang is there. on behalf of Deputy Inspector Lou? 
I see. I see Jackson Chang is there, but he's muted. Let me see. Uh, Officer. He's in the panelist section, right? There's so many people. He's unmuting. He's unmuting. Okay. Hi, guys. Then, How are you? Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. All right, anytime. So we'd like to know, you know, what's going on. I know there's a task force. And then when we finish up, there'll be questions. But I also would like to ask what what we can do as community members to to be of aid and assistance to our Asian brothers and sisters, what can we do? All right. I mean, as as of right now, and as you you guys heard what the first lady said, you know, if you guys see something, just make sure to report it. You know, every situation is different, and every situation dictates a different solution. We're not asking anyone to get directly involved. You know, obviously, every situation and scenario is, is clearly different. You know, um, but if you see if you see something, just please report it. You know, I think uh, certain times it may require an intervention, but like I said, it really depends on the situation. Um, so, and your neighbors, you know, we really encourage everyone to report. That's really a big thing. Um, I know there's a little bit of hesitancy with sometimes victims coming forward due to the culture and due to uh, a perceived misconception that, you know, the police aren't interested or, or we're too busy or something of that nature. That couldn't be further from the truth. And that is... These crimes are definitely something we want to take a look at, all of them, uh, regardless of whether or not there's a, a hate crime um, angle to it. We still want to take a look at it. And so what is the um, NYPD task force? I know there was a special task force formed. OK, and so the Asian hate crime task force is made up of one deputy inspector, three captains, lieutenants, sergeants and 25 detectives. Uh, we're all doing this on a volunteer basis, uh, in addition to our regular duties. And uh, all the detectives are investigators, meaning that there's no need to um, go to like a department related translator. Right away, these investigators will come out and they'll speak to the victims in their native language, which breaks down a lot of barriers. So there's no need for the victim to keep telling the same story over and over again, which could be very, you know, it's very traumatic. Yeah. And so, in our, I know you're from the fifth precinct, correct? Uh, no, I'm actually assigned to the detective bureau. Detective bureau. Okay, so we have right. we have um, Officer Nelson here from the first precinct, and I don't know, Brian, can you? I don't know how many have we had many crimes in our community, hate crimes in our community. And 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 Officer Chang, would you or detective? Is it? Yeah, it's we'll keep... Captain Chang. I'm sorry, it's, it's Captain. Captain, 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 Chang, actually, yes. Captain. So, okay. how, have we had many crimes targeted against our Asian members of our Believe community? Believe it or not, mo most of the crimes that have like an Asian uh, hate crime nature to it occurs in Manhattan. Um, specifically, in the first, I don't have those stats in front of me, um, but we are taking a look at. Believe it or not, even the past complaints that have not been handled as a as a hate crime, we're taking a second look at those as well. Is there is there a time limit? I mean, going back how far? Uh, we're going back at least a minimum, at least since COVID started. So I like a year, which is approximately a year. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, OK, and uh, Captain um, Officer Nelson, are you here? Yes. Hi, Pat. Hi, how are you? Thanks for coming out Good. tonight. Do you Good have morning. any? That's on what's going on in our community. So the first precinct currently has one active case uh, that occurred in front of 176 Broadway about 10 days ago, maybe. And so, I mean, it's so you can't really report too much. So, yeah, I mean, as far as, uh, you know, it's one confirmed case that, you know, they definitely deemed was a uh, was a hate crime. Um, after that, I, I'm not sure about statistics. I haven't seen anything um, up until today. That was still the only one that we had. Okay. All right. So is there anything else you would like to add or Captain Chang? Is there anything else you would like to add before we ask questions? I just want to reiterate what, uh, what the captain said. Um, the only way we're going to really be able to you know, get a grip on this is, it, is to report the incidents. We, if we don't know about it, we can't... Um, Put our resources in the proper places so you know the best thing to do is i know sometimes people are fearful they don't want to call 911 they don't want to 
talk with us, but it's, you know, it's definitely, you know, better if, you know, you, you let us know that way we can then provide the, the proper resources to handle the situation. And just both of you, um, are, is NYPD working with any specific groups in the Asian community to try to combat this? So I know the fifth precinct is. Um, they had a they had a Zoom meeting yesterday on it. Ah, okay, okay. So, um, would you do us a favor, Brian? If you hear of anything else, would or none of the meeting that's going to take place, would you just let us know so we can put it either in our newsletter or let our community know? Absolutely. Sure. Thank you. So let's open it up to questions. <laughs> Uh, it looks like um, we have a member of the community uh, who had their hand up before, Don Lee. Uh, I'm going to yeah. unmute Mr. Lee. You're thank you again for, thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate uh, the opportunity. Thank you for coming. I out. just want to have a comment about to respond to what the officer said. First of all, I want to thank NYPD, especially the Asian Hate Crime Task Force, for volunteering their time to to work on this. Um, the issue is not so much the rank and file. I think the the, the policy at the policy level something needs to be looked at. I dealt with have helped a lot of victims of hate crimes and crime over the years, especially in the last year. And it's not, I just want to tell share with you in all cases, if you walk down Chinatown and you say to them, you need to report, why are you not reporting? They will say this to you in Chinese. Mo Yong get meaning useless. Not that they're fearful, not this culture, none of that. The reality is that many, some of them said to me, the experience after reporting, sometimes it's actually worse than the crime itself, right? Because you keep getting calls over and over again. And we need to remember, these are immigrants who have one singular job to take care of their family. And you're taking them away from the work and they don't mind answering these questions, but weeks after weeks after weeks, and then the grandma kid that I helped over in Brooklyn, we literally went from July to November and we're still answering the same question. What happened to you? I walked out, someone slapped me, set me on fire. And that was asked from July to November. How many times, and then also think about this. When they call, the family member are the one that answered the call. Now you drag the children into this and they have to explain to their grandkids sometime what's going on. I really hope that we look at what happened to the victims and we need to stop. And again, I don't mean this to be respectful for the officers on there and we will encourage people to report crime, but understand what is the reason behind that people are not reporting because nothing gets done. The case that happened in our own community where someone was stabbed within less than 24 hours, the NY, the DA decided it's not a hate crime. That does not give us a lot of comfort. So that's a key point. And respecting everybody's time, I make uh, like one more point. We in community board number one, and I'm a, I've been living here since the building of um, Berry Park City. We in a way contributed to what's happening in Chinatown. And this is how we contributed to, the, to what's happening. And I called this out years before. We have in Berry Park City, ambassador that walked the area. I think 36 of them, right? In downtown Alliance, we also have an ambassador program who walks around. So when they push all of the people who really need help, the homeless, people who have mental issues, they all end up in Chinatown. So it's predictable that last year before COVID, or the year before, that four people were murdered by someone with a hammer, right? But nobody wanna talk about that. So this is happening way before COVID. And it is happening because of lack of planning because you are pushing we in this neighborhood, our leadership for good intention to put ambassadorship on living now. So from the tip of Manhattan, where do you push people out to? Chinatown and nothing's happening there. I really hope that my recommendation to the community board is to really work with the local business improvement district to work with NYPD to come up with a comprehensive solution. We all in this together, let's, make that a true statement because right now we're not right better park city gets ambassador 24 7 likewise downtown alliance but not in chinatown not one i mean we're going to organize a private 
volunteers, but that should not be the way. Right. So thank you very much and uh, appreciate the time. The thank you so much. Thanks. And do we have your contact information? Can we reach out to you? Yes, it's uh, I'll, okay. I'll put it down there. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank I'll you so much. Chat. Thank okay, you. Don, I appreciate it. Uh, Hi, Don. It's uh, Captain Jackson Chang. I just want to, well, I just want to address some of your some of your concerns. All of them are absolutely valid. Let me be the first to say. Um, my parents came here from Hong Kong, right? I'm a first generation here. I know the mentality and the culture very well, and I know it's very. Pers I know sometimes the police department is very persistent with the interviews over and over again. But just with that case in Brooklyn, like you brought up, I was very intimately involved in that case. Actually, that the, the Asian Hate Crime Task Force responded there because her memory was a little foggy without getting too much into it, and she wasn't able to make an ID. So when the task force responded over there, she cooperated with us fully. She was very coherent. She remembered exactly what happened, and she was very, very happy to speak to us. And you're right. Initially, you know, we did speak to her daughter first. We answered the door, and um, but we, we, we came to an, to an arrest of two juveniles in that case. So I firmly believe that the, the, the forming of this task force really helped in that case. Otherwise, so I think sometimes seeing a familiar face, you know, to, to these immigrants, it's, it's very... It, it makes it, it breaks down walls and it breaks down barriers. So it really helped tremendously in that case. And I understand your concerns with the homeless and everything like that. Um, that's something I'll talk to the first precinct about. Um, I know your concerns very valid that, you know, and I, I know sometimes the interviews are very, very long and they get dragged out and you're almost kind of re victimizing the victim. I totally understand that because no one wants to keep reliving the same situation. Um, that's something that once you know the Asian task force got started, you know we're trying to lessen that as much as possible. Our investigators, our detectives, are all investigators that speak the native tongue. It prevents, or hopefully, it will prevent the victim from having to retell that story, that same horrible, horrific story, over and over again. No, I appreciate that, Captain Chang, and I, I really thank you and all the Asian Hate Crime Task Force. Maybe a resolution from the Company Point One is to ask the NYPD to fully fund you guys to make it a permanent at least until we have a better situation to fund the Asian Hate Crime Task Force as a legitimate working organization with the NYPD. And I just want to share that the, the thing is that the reality is that we live through that, right? And no fault of your own, but the, the truth of the matter is in this case, the grandma and the daughter went to the, went to the precinct and they were told to go home and call 911, right? And then I ended up calling for them because they didn't understand why, what's going on. So I appreciate that was the work of- I agree. Right, and I appreciate all that you guys do, but after the PD interviews, I went through two months dealing with cop counsel because it's juvies, right? And also right. once, and this one last point, I'm just gonna give, give the floor back to other people. It's Think okay. about it. You have two 13 year olds who slap someone and send them on fire. What would these two 13 year olds when they go back to school? So I urge that we also tell the Board of Education to start having these conversations every single school parents need to get involved to that to know what's happening to the neighbors so thank you and i'll be speaking to the i was invited to speak to uh, terry at the bbc school where my daughter graduated so we will have that conversation in Berry park city so i hope that happens across the city across the city two 13 years old set a 90 year old woman on fire we need to figure out what's going on here thank you oh my gosh thank you thank you um i think our council Woman is here, Margaret Chen. I can't see. Margaret, are you here? No, no. Uh, Cora just asked me to send a statement for for Margaret into the uh, the chat. Okay. I said, did did Cora want to say something? No, Cora had to run. There's a gateway tenants um, okay. meeting. So Vera she... and Francis, I hope you're keeping the list because I couldn't catch up with what you everybody. You were writing down, so I'm I know I'm texting Vera. you the list as they come up, and so look at your text; they're all okay. listed. Vera, hi, you there? Hi, Pat. Hi, everybody. Hi, Pauline. <laughs> Good to see you. Thank you, Don, for um, all of what you just said. Um, yes, I mean, and thank you, uh, Captain Chang and Officer Nelson, for being on here. I work in Chinatown, I live in the seaport, I walk back and forth, and every day I wonder if I'm a moving target or if someone is going to attack me. This sense of feeling, constantly being on high alert is completely um, unbelievable, unhealthy, creating uh, enormous anxiety. 
I don't even want to talk about myself. I'm thinking about my people that I employ. I worry about them who all uh, work in Chinatown and how they have to travel back and forth on the subway. I hope that they are safe and I hope that every day they do not get attacked. I just like to know um, what can we do more to make sure that, you know, that we feel overall safe, that we have justice for the victims and people who have been attacked and how do we prevent these things from happening again and especially copycat type incidences. What, what are being, what is being done right now? It, it's, it's, truly a cruel situation when you think that with COVID, you know, we have kids that want to go back to school and many parents are afraid to send their kids back to school. Um, safety on the subways or safety within the schools, um, bias incidences that we have, uh, we have businesses are able to open up again, even slightly so, but yet they want to close at five o'clock because they want to go home. This is, you know, this is not a tenable situation is not going to help us become resilient. Um, but on, on the on the level of being safe, justice for victims and preventing these things from happening again, what more can we do um, within the MNPD? Hi guys, this is uh, Officer Nelson. Um, the first precinct, well, actually all of Manhattan South, uh, I'm not sure if it's any of the other boroughs, but we are sending two, two cops every day on the day tours and on the four to 12 tour into the transit system um, to do additional patrol in uh, specified locations that transit is deemed needing, you know, additional assistance. Um, so they're trying the best that they can to cover you know, uh, the, the, the stations that get the most traffic and have the most incidents in them. Uh, as far as the homeless, it's not gonna it's it's not gonna a problem that's gonna be able to go away overnight. Where we are in the process of um, coordinating with Department of Homeless Services, uh, uh, using some outside ag agencies such as like the Bowery uh, Residency Committee, and uh, we work with the Downtown Alliance. Um, there is, I mean, no, you know, we can't sugarcoat it. There definitely is a homeless problem downtown, um, and uh, we got a new CEO in Captain Smith, and he, he's putting it at the forefront of, of what he uh, is deemed important in our command. Um, but it's just it's going to definitely take time. As far as how do we make people feel safe again, um, we do have uh, the NCO program, and um, our guys are, are out there and can be contacted very easily. Um, do get involved with them. They, uh, they love to send out uh, updates a couple of times a week. Uh, about what's going on in their sectors. Um, I'm in the community affairs office. You guys can get my email on the website, uh, the newyorkcity.gov first precinct website. Um, if not, you can get it through CB1. And if we have a chat here, I'll put it in the chat uh, when I'm done speaking. Uh, you can definitely contact me. Um, it's basically just, you, you just need to, you know, have contact with us and we'll have contact with you. Um, my office, I know we have a thousand different things going on at once. I'm constantly in contact with Lucian and with Pat um, and Tammy from CB1, Lucy. Uh, I'm always in contact with Cora Fung from uh, Councilwoman Chin's office. So we're, we're there. We just need to know what the problem is. Um, I'm not saying that nobody's telling us, but obviously, you know, we have a thousand different hats that we wear. So it's better if I, if I can get a personal uh, relationship with you, I can probably... Um, maybe ease some of your, your fears. So if you definitely want to get in contact with me, I, I'd be more than happy to uh, correspond with you. Okay, thank you. Pat, You're welcome. Uh, this is Chuck, can I, can I ask something? Um, so- yeah, Of course. <laughs> okay, yeah, no, I, I was, you know, um, Don was talking about like the <coughs> uh, repeated interview of the, victim in that case. And, you know, I think that may not be a bad thing because if they're repeatedly interviewing someone, you know, it means that the police and law enforcement is taking it seriously because if they're not interviewing people, then, you know, they, they're not doing their job. But like in terms of um, like Chinatown, are there more foot posts or police presence uh, to, um, you know, to deter and, and you know, violence or, and, and make the residents uh, feel more secure, uh, you know, going about their daily lives. Like, you know, what Barry was talking about, like going to job and not feeling like 
you know, uh, being going to be attacked, but it's going to be more police officers that will bring a sense of like, safety to the residents here. Uh, unfortunately, I can't speak for Chinatown because that's in the jurisdiction of the fifth precinct. Um, so I don't want to say something that I'm not 100% sure of, about. I think that what we can do is we can reach out to the fifth precinct and we can um, send some questions to them. How's that? I asked this because uh, my one of my friends uh, from the DA's office was actually like, you know, walking down Chinatown today for like two hours and he would, did not see any police presence. Uh, would, would you send us a, a email, send Lucian an email? Sure. And we'll, we'll, we'll send it out to the fifth precinct and ask them, you know, maybe they can send someone to speak to us also, but ask them what, how they're sending out um, officers on duty. Thank you. Can, okay. Can I just so, a quick Pat, comment back to Mr. Help? C? Yeah, please. Okay? I know. Because the I'm point sorry. that he made about, because the done. point that he made about calling too many times means they're doing their job. Um, that's what I used to believe. But from the victim's point of view, when they cause them so many times, they begin to doubt whether or not the NYPD believe them or they're just right. questioning, or they're not believing them. So there's the other side of the coin. And I no. just think that they, you know, we need to find the right balance. And, Don, I, you it's, know, it's, um, I, I think, you know, is one is they, a patrol officer trying to find out and want to hear directly from the victim. Then is the detective that we don't want to hear the victim. Then it's a district attorney who you really wants to hear from the victim. It's not like, you know, you just say, say, you know, you gotta explain it to them because not don't, don't give up. You know, there will be a lot of cases with these victims who just want to give up. And then the, the only person who benefits from it is the person who, who committed the crime. So, you know, you just gotta like explain to them to be patient, you know, let like, you know, quick justice is not, it's not like uh fair too, you know? Yeah, Mr. C, it's two months of questioning Pat, back and forth. Um, and I'm not saying anymore. I'm not gonna say anymore. Thank you. Yeah, we've got yeah, Let me on. help you with this. Okay. Yeah, I know Bob you with this Bob's list. Is Bob Bob's next. Right. People you bend down after you speak. Thank you. I just want to um I just want to be a follow on to Don Lee because I have a, a fair amount of experience with Chinese people and they, and it's and it's really been terrible how worried they are walking down the street. And you know, even doctors that we've known, one one doctor even walking into Beth Israel right on 14th Street right in front of the right in front of the hospital got hit in the head. It was it's terrible and I don't know that there's been any real follow on on that, even though the person was captured uh, by the hospital, um, the hospital security cameras. So I think um, the the amount of worry that I see from day to day, and 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 people that I know obviously very well, are really afraid to walk on the streets, and really afraid to walk across in parks, really even afraid to have me walking out on the streets. At night, because they are really afraid of a of a real release of a lot of toxins here, and I really think that uh, I really think that um, that fear is really present, and I think that the the God knows what the community board is supposed to do about this, but there really isn't enough reach to those people, and there really isn't enough touch to those people to really matter i mean it's just Bob, i don't want to fundamental this distrust is there and the right. final thing i wanted to say is that uh, i i think i've heard about a few incidents underground with uh on the subway with people being pushed onto the tracks that were pretty close like in the city hall area is that true or am i did i just mishear that officer nelson sorry can you repeat the question uh, did, did, did I hear about a couple of incidents, um, on the subway platforms at the city hall station where people were, where a Chinese person or two were pushed onto the tracks or there were incidents on the, at the Don't subway. Worry. Um, so I'm not aware Don't of see. that, but that, that station is, uh, I believe manned by the fifth precinct. So, uh, I, I thought it was transit things. too. Well, transit district too, but I, I don't believe the first precinct gets those reports. I believe they go to the fifth precinct. 
Uh huh. For that station, so I wouldn't I wouldn't see those reports on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Bob sent us a quick email, and we will put that on our list of questions for the fifth precinct. We've got to we've got to move along. Thank um, you. I know Mariama had a question. I, I do want to say something, but I'm happy to allow the Asian people, the members of the community that have their hands raised, I see as well, speak before me. That's fine. So, Francis, you had the list. Pauline is uh, is on and she had something to say. Pauline? Hi, um, so I'm taking off my DOHMH hat and putting on my Chinatown born and raised hat. Um, so I, I do uh, echo Vera's um, concern and anxiety. My parents still live in Chinatown. And I think, you know, touching a little bit on my current work at the DOHMH, I just have a suggestion maybe for the police department and the Asian um, Hate Crimes Task Force that maybe um, to tie in sort of Don Lee's concerns is to really have and emphasize mental health um, uh, you know, having that as part of their outreach when they're talking to victims of hate crimes and really encouraging them to utilize either any of the city's resources that are available or any other sort of mental health resource that is available because we don't want to re victimize people over and over again. And especially among the Asian American community, I know that, you know, talking about mental health is sort of still taboo. This is something that the city has been trying to change for a while. Um, so if there's anything I can do in my capacity, City, working at the health department, I'm more than happy to do, but also as a private citizen, I am really just so concerned about this and I, I have a lot of anxiety um, regarding the safety of my parents. So, you know, again, I just want to offer um, my personal assistance on my, on my late person time. And then if there's anything that the New York City Health Department can do um, to assist either the NYPD or the community, I am also here. So just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Francis, who's next on the list? Chris, uh, this is from the community. I'm skipping community board people because we have like a couple of people in the com community that. Yeah, go ahead. Chris, it's Christopher. Uh, Chris, why? Christopher. Hi, 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 guys. Thank you so much. I'm a Battery Park resident. Thanks for allowing me to speak. I appreciate it. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, yeah. great. I uh, just want to thank, you know, everyone for all the work and, and letting us speak. I really deeply appreciate that. Also, you know, appreciate the work of the hate crimes task force. As well, as the community work that Don Lee has done. Um, my, my question is very simple. We, we've been pushing now for a little over a month for the hate crimes task force. To be assigned full time, you know, staff as well as funding. What can we do to get the NYPD or the mayor to do that? You know, to have that, you know, uh, I mean, I, I'm assuming that's a fairly simple, you know, thing to happen that if the chief of detectives or the commissioner decides to make it happen, it can. But I like to sort of, you know, maybe sort of pose that question if there are any answers here. Well, we can certainly write a rezo, which Don asked us okay. to do. Okay. And um, uh, Captain Chen, are you there? And Officer Nelson, are you there? If you have any suggestions, uh, as far as getting it fully funded, that would be something that you'd have to uh, speak with City Hall about and speak with probably uh, police commissioner's office or chief of department's office at one police plaza. I mean, because uh, uh, Captain Chang, right now you're all you're all volunteers, you said, and so you're doing this. I assume you're doing your regular work and doing this after work or you know doing work. So. It would obviously be of great interest to you if we were able to get, or if the city were able to fund a full-time task force, correct? Yes, I, I would, I would, I don't want to speak for Captain, uh, for Captain Chang, but uh, yeah, I mean. Is Captain would, Chang there? It would be beneficial. Right. Captain Chang, you still there? Do we see him? Well, anyway, Christopher, that's the answer, and and so great, you thank know, you. We, we can start by writing a rezo. That'd be great. I, I'm deeply appreciative of that, and I want to just raise that part of the pushback within the Asian American community is a desire not to harm African Americans and Latinos, and asking for more funding in the wake of BLM. You know, you know what I mean? we'll all be doing this together. This this okay. affects all of us. You yeah. know, and that that's the we answer. We should all get each other's yeah. rallies. We should right. all. 
there at front and center at all of the news conferences. We should all be there together. So know? it's kind of, and and that's you know and, and thank you so much for that because that's part of what I'm bringing back. And I'm like I go to these things and people understand the need for some safety and some role for police as long as they're behaving sort of righteously and and correctly within what we want because I think that's what BLM was about. You know, like making sure they do their job properly and not in a racist right. way, right. you know, but it's and, not about yeah. saying no police action, period. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, so. right. Okay. And by the way, that was something uh, that Mitch, Mitch Eric? Roman talked about earlier that we all be there together. So, yeah. who, Eric? Eric? Hello. Eric. Hello, Pat. It's good to see you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay, excellent. Excellent. So, um, you know, I have a couple of things. Uh, number one uh, suggestion, Pat, and I've read this a couple of times. I, I don't know why the fifth precinct doesn't have liaison with the community board in addition to CB1. I understand the overlap is not gigantic, but it's significant, and I don't think they're resistant they to do. this idea. Well, yeah, I don't think they're resistant. I, I, they, I, we don't know what happened to Officer Lou. He was going to come tonight. And right. so we will reach out to them, and I don't think they're resistant, right? Right, uh, Brian, uh, uh, Officer right. Nelson, they're not resistant. All right. So I have a couple more things. Um, you know, I, I I recognize that I submitted a uh, list of proposals to you guys, and I realize it's 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 a laundry list. There's a lot to digest, and I don't, expect, I don't expect that it's going to be uh, covered tonight. Uh, I'm very happy to go back to it at some point in the future that you want, and even do a, a different presentation for you. Um, however, uh, it is time limited. Uh, you know, they're expecting uh, to have, uh, I guess, the proposal in place uh, next month. Right. So, so, you know, we just got it today, and I just had a quick look at it. And Lucian and I can have a chat tomorrow. And if we need to, we we will reach out. To you. No, I appreciate that. Next, and, and finally, it's kind of a, a statement, and that is, you know. Um, about the, the Asian anti Asian violence that we've been seeing. Um, right. It's very personal to me. Uh, you know, 34 years ago, I, I married my college sweetheart, and uh, she's a Chinese American born on Elizabeth Street. And um, I'm very grateful and privileged to have been adopted into their family. And I love them. I love her more than oxygen. And I'm very protective of them. And I am revolted by this explosion and crimes that we've been seeing towards the Asian community. And, yeah. um, but the thing about it is it's hardly new, you know, they were systematically selected for victimization from day one. You know, the neighborhood that we know and love as Chinatown was in its inception, no different than the Jewish ghettos of my forefathers. It was kind of simultaneously a place of refuge, but also a place of confinement. Mm -hmm. And I really wanna know where the, the support for this community has been um, from the administration. You know, Andrew Yang pointed out that 16% of New York City's population is Asian American, but they only receive 1.4% of the social services money. You know, mm -hmm. you guys were very gracious in supporting us on the fight about the Chinatown jail, but, you know, there was a jail there for 182 years. And when we first opposed its expansion, we got labeled as NIMBYs and racists. Mm -hmm. uh, when an Asian is stabbed in Chinatown by a man who admits he did it because of the way he looked, I don't understand how it's not a race related hate crime. Now, I understand that all crimes are not race related, and but I do know that a lot of crimes are hate related. It's very hard for you to say when you stab another person that uh, they you had love in your heart. Right. So yeah. I do want to point out that there is another rally planned for this Monday, March 22nd at 1 p.m. at the 5 St. James Place. Could you please send that information to Lucian so he can post it for everyone? Sure. I, I would okay. be very happy to, to. I just, you know, yeah. I feel like the last rally it was like a photo op for politicians to come around and, and issue real hollow platitudes about making real change. And it would be a shame right. if that ended up the same way again. All right. So thank you. Just post it and, and I mean, send it to Lucian. We'll post it and hopefully we'll get a good turnout. Thank you, Eric. We'll probably be thank reaching you. out to you again. Thank you. Um, who okay. else do we have? Chanterelle, uh, am I pronouncing it right? Chanterelle? Hi, Sloan? yes, that's correct. Hi, oh, I'm Chanterelle, cool. yes. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm actually Vera's sister. Uh, oh, so she let me know that you guys were having a meeting today and 
obviously this issue is is so important to me to us um i have lived uh downtown in the district since 2004 and own in battery park uh, but more than that i was in uh, an ada at the manhattan district attorney's office from 2004 to 2011. Um, so i'm very happy to see captain chang uh here at this meeting tonight as well as officer nelson i'm not sure if i cross paths with you guys but uh, the angle that I want to focus on tonight is 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 the law enforcement angle because I know there's many ways uh, and many solutions that we have to deploy to address this this current crisis. Uh, but the one that I care most about and I think that there's an urgent need for is the law enforcement response. Um, I have been you know obviously following this issue very closely and working with Don since last year in March when the uptick started uh, and. I am concerned that in some things that I've read, and I, I want to verify this is true, um, but it says that NYPD has a policy uh, in which words have to be exchanged in order to classify the incident as a hate crime. Um, and I know that that's not the law, and I know that as a prosecutor, um, that certainly wasn't you know what what the law or the policy that we were. Um, following uh, circumstantial evidence and evidence of any kind uh, that can prove uh, the racial animus is, is obviously all uh, to be considered. So I don't know if this is a, being misreported in the media or or what, but um, I did want to hear, that's my first question um, to NYPD, uh, is that the policy? And, and if so, then I think we do need to work with a law enforcement to change that and make sure that NYPD and the prosecutor's offices, whether it's the district attorney's offices in all five boroughs, as well as the attorney general's offices are completely coordinated in this. Because obviously if, you know, the police can't uh, charge a crime as a hate crime uh, in the first instance, and you guys are on the front lines, uh, that's important data that's gonna get lost uh, and the accountability that needs to be taken will be taken. And by the time the cases get to the prosecutors, um, both time and evidence can be lost in the in the shuffle. So, um, can you address uh, uh, this issue, Captain Chang and Officer Nelson? Hi, it's uh, Jackson. Hi. Uh, okay. So we look at every situation, every crime individually. We I, I know exactly what you're saying. Like if, for example, if a person is is assaulted, and let's say there is no indication that person was targeted because of, you know, a certain race or, you know, something to that effect or certain words aren't said. That's not the case. Uh, we take a look at each crime individually as it is. Um, so if someone just goes down the street and they're targeting someone of like a certain color, for example, you know, we don't just look at it as like, okay, well, they didn't say anything. So we're not going to make it a hate crime. That's not the case. We actually look at the totality of circumstances and everything. Right. Okay, good. No, I mean, and there that's, and yeah, there's nothing that's, that's what the law, yeah. Correct. And we don't have anything operationally written down where it says, um, you know, if this doesn't happen, it doesn't get classified as that. We we take a look at each crime individually as it is. I, I, I totally okay. get your point and I understand that, that. That's good. No, and I'm glad to hear that. And 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 I think then something has to be done um to change that perception. I don't know why it's been reported this way, you know, in, in the media. I can find the article, uh, the one that I can recall that actually stated that um, in, in the news, uh, because that's that's very disturbing. And, and if that's the perception, right, that will contribute to under-reporting, which is, I know, the, the point you made at the beginning of this, this meeting to encourage everyone to report. But if, you know, people are discouraged from reporting because they don't think action is going to be taken by law enforcement, then that's a problem. No, so, so our, yeah, so anything we can do to change that perception, because I, People have told me this and, and I've heard it and I've read it myself in the media, in the news. Um, so, so we can emphasize, like you just said, that it's the totality of circumstances and the evidence that's considered. Uh, you, you that know, going, be, back to, yes. Go, going back to what you said too, um, we also can't treat every single crime that where like, um, you know, a person of a certain color is targeted as a hate crime as well, because that kind of takes away the hate crime, if, if I'm making sense, does, does that make sense to you? Um, oh, can, you can you repeat that? Sorry, I didn't. We can't, um, we, like, we can't make every single crime 
that targeting someone of a certain minority a hate crime either, because that kind of takes away from from real hate crimes. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Like we can't just make. Well, you can't. Right, you're saying you can't actually charge it just based on the the, the fact of the person's race or, or any of the other protected classes themselves. Right, right. there obviously exactly. has to be evidence. Right. Exactly. Yeah. No, there has to be there has to be evidence, but but sometimes you know it's not necessary for the word for a racial slur to be spoken um, because there others there's other evidence. Um, oh, correct. For example, that there's some ra there's that there's some racial animus. Um, which, which, which I would hope that that you know the DA's offices, Attorney General's office, NYPD, that you all are coordinated. That there is a standard, uniform application of the law, um, and, and maybe that. I guess that would be my my next question. Just you know, are there efforts being made to coordinate with the off the the prosecutors' offices, um, given this this urgent this urgent there crisis? Or as, as you know. You know, sometimes when we do bring up the hate crime charge, it's it's really the prosecutor that drops that charge. We gladly bring it when we have the evidence for it, but sometimes we're we're kind of stonewalled at that point. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure being a prosecutor, you know about you know you're familiar with that. Sometimes the evidence is just lacking, and that's where we get stonewalled. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that, yeah, that, that it would be good, I think, for the coordination effort um, to remain because I think that whether it's NYPD, say, not classifying or, or the prosecutor dropping it, you know, after you bring the case in, it, there, there has to be this uniformity. And I know it's tough because I, I was on that side and I see what happens and there's so many pieces and, and phases, you know, along the whole criminal case. Um, but, I, but I think this is an area that we can all focus on um, to improve. And I know if Chris Kwok is still on the call, you know, Abney had issued a really good report um, last month, I think it was, on, you know, ways in which we can all try to help uh, and improve on, on this. So, um, I'm, you know, I'm avail I'll make myself available to help in any way I can. Um, so, well, just, you know. Can you get, um, Lucian, do we have that report? Do we know that, about that report? I will have that report on in my right, position well, at it this moment. Out. So, Chantrell, maybe you can pass that along to us. Sure. Yeah. Here, and I don't think. want to steal Chris's thunder, Chris, if you're <laughs> if you're still on. But yeah, it is. I think it it lays out a, a really good roadmap um, of the things that we can try to do and or take action. On. Don't see Chris. Okay. Well, thank you, and glad you came. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, and enjoy wearing those Quinn sweaters, by the way, <laughs> Vera was telling me about. Um, oh, <laughs> Francis, but who else? Uh, Mariama, go to it. And then Mimi, you put your hand down, but you you had it up for a while. I don't know if you still want to speak, but you should go after her. Mariama. Hi. Yes. Thank you. Um, first, very very quickly, let me apologize first for not having on my camera. I'm having work done in my house, so it's just very difficult to keep going back and forth and moving stuff and the boxes and whatnot. Just, I just can't right now. Um, but first, let me very quickly make everybody aware. There's an event on Friday night at six o'clock in Union Square called the Peace Vigil for Victims of Asian Hate. And there'll be a gathering there uh, and an opportunity for community members and leaders to come together and, and to mourn some of the victims that have been lost, um, I guess particularly in, in Georgia and other parts of the country, and also to, um, you know, just come together on the issues of, of violence and brutality and recommit to, you know, community building and re restoration of the, our humanity. <laughs> so that that's first and foremost. And then second, I just um, want to say something um, with with all thanks uh, to those who came tonight, um, particularly our guests, the officers, and um, and all respect to everybody that's here. I think it's important to to say the crime aspect, the criminal aspect of this, of course, I mean, cannot go without attention. I mean that people have to um, pay. There has to be recompense for 
for what's happened to people and the loss of life and people that have been beaten. But there's a root to all of this. You know, there's a root to going to your job and feeling afraid. Um, you know, uh, some of us have, have deal with that every day. You know, our parents, worrying about our parents, worrying about our children, if they're gonna come home. That, that is a very, it's a very real thing. And it, it didn't just happen overnight. We didn't just arrive at this place where people are attacking agents out of nowhere. That the root is systemic racism and we have to address that part of it also. We all, as a, you know, as large a we and a small we as you can get, you know, so as a society, as a nation, as a, as a world, and as a community board, have to do better, myself included, about bringing the people to the table with expertise in this. We need social justice folks on this, not just community members and not just police. Because when you're talking about systemic racism, I mean, by virtue, by definition, it is racism from within the system. We are part of the system. We are effectively, you know, government uh, representatives, you know, uh, de facto civil servants. And of course, the officers are, are real ones and, and those who work for the office of the community board and um, all the other agencies that we deal with. So they, they, we are part of the system. We are here tonight because the system itself, the former so-called leader of the free world incited this racism on Asian people. It did not just occur. So the system itself is what brought us here. We are not going to fix it by only sitting here at the table with the system. I, I'd like us to commit in the future, and again, myself included, so I'm, I'm not like this, you know, going against anybody, trying to, trying to, you know, offend anyone. But I'd like us to commit in the, going forward that we're gonna talk about issues of racism, that we're not gonna just get an agency in here, that we're going to, from now on, also have um, a, a, a related social justice group, organization, that can, that can help us to navigate this, the topic properly and give it the attention and, and respect that it deserves. That's all. Thanks, Mariama. Um, there, oh, Mimi, did you want to say something? Um, yeah, I, um, I'm an Asian American, uh, Lower Manhattan, um, and I've spent some time on the internet recently um, because that's my whole life, essentially, trying to start off on school. Um, this is why I took my hand down. I was like, I don't know what I'm going to say. Um, but ultimately, like, there's this, uh, there's a comment on Reddit that I want to read to you all about um, an encounter that one of our uh, members of our community experienced. Um, the, uh, I sent the link to the comment solution so he can send it out to everybody if you want to refer to it and like continue on with it, you know, but it's Reddit. So like, you don't have to, it's like, okay, it's like a bad place. Um, anyway, so somebody was asking, like, is there really a lot of violence towards Asian people? In regards to a photo in um, sub subreddit R picks, and um, one of the comments about their experience goes as follows: My experience in the past month or so living in Fidei and going out for errands, groceries, takeout in this area, Chinatown and Midtown, had someone tell me to watch it, Chinaman, in a threatening manner as I left a restaurant and accidentally bumped him with my takeout bag while trying to hold the door open for him. My bad, forgive me, I guess. Had a group of young men follow me around and chant the Asian sounding sing song. You know, I won't get into that. Um, that went on for a few blocks. My blood boiled, but my whole lifetime has been one long training session of swallowing my pride, trying to disassociate my identity from my culture so much 
as not to succumb to crushing humiliation and indignation from events like this and being non-confrontational. So I remain an emotional victim, but not a physical victim. I guess I'd rather be sad than dead. Saw an Asian woman being followed around by another woman screaming at her at the top of her lungs. I don't know the background, but the Asian woman was clearly very upset and trying to walk away, AKA it didn't look like she was running away after having stolen something or striking someone. That is recently. Beats being dragged into the woods behind my high school and getting beaten down by my sports teammates. Um, but that happened like within a month of somebody living in our space. And I know that it's like heckling, but like, and I don't know what we can really do about that. Like, I guess it's probably not against the law to heckle somebody. Um, the following seems menacing, et cetera. I wanted to add that um, as like a personal account for anybody that just doesn't really understand what it's like out there. Um, it just gets, just gets weird. It's weird. Thanks. Do we have Francis? Uh, public? Uh, we have um, Jessica. Jessica Demola. Jessica? Hi, yes, okay. Yeah. Hi, sorry. I can turn my camera on too if I can figure it out. No, you you, you can't. But oh, I can't. Can, okay. Yeah. Never mind. Um, I just had a quick question. Um, thank you, everyone. And so just echoing what Mariama was saying, um, Mariama, hi, we met um for the first time on Sunday um at the neighborhood meeting. And the the root of all of this being um systemic racism. And so <laughs> And, and someone else had also said that this this is not new, and I'm just wondering if there are other options that are being considered to support the com community that are outside of the law enforcement angle. And so, if there is anyone on this call with expertise that could be offered, um, you know, we've heard extensively that um, you know a lot of people are not reaching out to the police for a variety of different reasons, and so you know, policing um understanding you know being part of this discussion not being the only option and, and things like Maryam, i think you said um you know connecting to a social justice group or organization to help the community give the attention and respect it deserves um i think is a great idea and are there other community organizations we can connect with that are skilled in things like de-escalation um bystander trainings for people who may be witness to someone experience a hate crime, like what Mimi, what you were just saying about heckling. I mean, that is something that I'm sure people were around and, and witnessed that maybe could have in, intervened and at the very least showed support to the person who was experiencing that. Um, and so I'm just wondering if there's some type of community support that we could you know, think about doing or publicly demonstrate that um, to address some of these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Well, this is our first time. Jessica, thanks for coming in and speaking out tonight. <laughs> it's our first time. Oh, we got one more person. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think that we, you know, obviously need to discuss this further. Um, Mitch and Justine, there's one more person from the public, Francis. Dominic. I can wait yeah, after that. Dominic. Uh, okay. Me Dominic. too. Public first. Mr. Sankowski. Hi, yeah, I'm, my name is Dominic. I'm a volunteer with Welcome to Chinatown, an organization supporting Chinatown small businesses. Um, I just want to thank everyone for their comments and I really simple. I just want to make sure everyone's aware that Welcome to Chinatown and other organizations, uh, other community organizations are going to be holding a rally against um, Asian American hate in Columbus Park, Sunday, March 21st, 1 p.m. I, I put a link in the chat uh, to a Facebook event uh, for that event. Um, I just want to make sure everyone's aware. Thank you. Dominic, thank you. So um, can we, we're going to call this to, a, uh, we'll have Justine and then Mitch and then, well, and then we've got to end, but go ahead, Justine and Mitch, and then we'll talk. Mitch, you had your hand up longer than I did. That's fine. You go first. You're on mute. You're muted, Mitch. I'm sorry. 
How did you guys hear that then? <laughs> uh, uh, thank you. I, uh, before I make a comment, I have one quick question for Off Officer Nelson, if he's still there, Pat. For it, I think she's still. Officer Nelson, Nelson there? He's still there. Yes, he's there. Brian, he's there. Okay, I uh, I don't hear him or see him, but uh, my question is, if he hears this. He mentioned that they're starting to send, you know, like like teams of 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 cops in in you know certain areas in the subway, and as somebody that that takes the train all the time, I I remember the days when they didn't they didn't have to be two or three cops together in one group. I know they changed that for safety reasons over the years. I just wanted to ask him because like like let's say there's like uh, train stations like East Broadway or Chamber Street, or other places like that where the train stations have multiple like lines and they're really separate entrances and it's, it's like a little city on the ground. Does the team have to stay together throughout their, uh, uh, their run or can they kind of, uh, you know, split up like in the train station and then meet out afterwards because uh, it would seem that there would be 200% more effective like that. I guess he's not there. Hi guys. Um, hmm. Just give me one second. Just okay, double. thank you, Officer Nelson. Sorry, I'm I'm out of I'm out of the protest. So, um, in regards to the train station, uh, that's really a question for Transit District Two. I can't uh, answer for them and their procedures. Uh, I spent my whole career, you know, above ground at the first precinct, so I, you know, I can't speak to how how they do that. Um, I I do know their community affairs officer, Justin. I can definitely approach him on it and uh, get get an answer back to you on it. Okay, I mean, it seems that they're kind of uh, pushing them to stay together because I've never seen individual offices where there's two in the station, not with each other. And it's definitely a safety concern. It's definitely right, I understand that. I know, I know they changed that a few years back, but at certain times, it, you know, where they don't have to be right together, but they can still be a different ends of the platform and visual with each other, it's just a suggestion. Fit? Great. Let's let's get a we'll get an answer. So. Okay, Pat, and then so can I then say the thing that we were casually talking about like over the last while? Right. Okay. So I've had this feeling for a while. It's nothing new, and I actually read a, a, a statement that the uh, Chinese professional basketball player Jeremy Lin had posted uh, sometime over the last few weeks. And you know, it seems that whenever something happens whether there's an, uh, an anti-white uh, on black uh, incident or an anti-Semitic incident or an anti-Asian incident, within seconds, the leaders of that group are the ones that are in front of the cameras, understandably so. But nothing's really, I guess I'm from the generation of like an offense against one is, a, is an offense against all. And I don't think anything's gonna change if only the people are at the, uh, of your group are the ones that are screaming to the rafters. If there's an anti-Semitic incident, instead of the first, the, the cameras being first around uh, an Orthodox Jewish politician from Brooklyn and a rabbi, Al Sharpton and, and, and the National Action Network and the Hispanic Society, a pol politician and, and Grace Chang from the Asian politician, they should be at the forefront, just like, you know, the Orthodox politician from Brooklyn should be at the forefront when there's a racist incident in Howard Beach or, uh, you know, uh, some Indian man uh, with a turban gets called ISIS and get rocks thrown at him. It, it seems that every, the leaders of that particular group are the ones that scream the loudest, but it really should be like the other group should be, the leaders of every other group should be at the forefront. I know that they're on the side of them after the fact, but uh, it just seems that if, we spent as much time, much energy, uh, being outraged at a at a uh, an incident against another group, and then our people see that from our group. I think that that would do a you know a, a lot of good. Mitch, you done? Totally agree with you, Mitch, and thank you for yeah. that comment. Yes, yes. Just... yeah, no, because I want to jump in and say yes. Well said, Mitch. Well said, Mariama. Well said, Jessica. And even Mr. Kwok brought up a piece of this at the very beginning. I think his name was Christopher Kwok, but I might have messed up his name. Um, but I think 
what is so important here is what what you're saying is we are all in this together and i think what separates and divides us and then makes us all ineffective is um it's the system the system is set up so that everybody is pigeonholed into places it's the systemic racism is what i'm is where i'm going with it and that's what mariama said and I think that having a place to go, a safe place to go, like tonight has been a safe place to go. I would hope that um, Officer Nelson does not feel attacked by this conversation. I would hope that um, the other police captain, I think who's on here, if he still is, doesn't feel attacked by this conversation at all, because I don't think anybody has. But I also feel as if things have been brought up slowly and carefully about Asian people feeling um, whether they're afraid to come forward or they're whatever, whatever the issues were that were raised. And um, I think that some of the same problems that affect different groups and people of color, they're all the same, it's all the same thread. And if we all stood together and had a forum in which we could all talk together in a safe space, and it would be so wonderful if this committee could, and could this community board could be that safe space for people to come together. I think that would be wonderful. Thank you. Muting. Thank you. Thank you, Justine. Um, okay, so first of all, I would like to uh, propose the, uh, that we have a discussion about writing a rezo in, in support. And Lucian, are you there? I'm here. Uh, in support of uh, asking the mayor to fully fund an Asian American task force, a permanent task force, as was um, brought up by, is it Don? Don, right? And um, and Captain Chang said that he thinks that would be a good idea also. So committee members, uh, what? how shall we proceed, Lucian? I think it oh. could be a that. <laughs> Yeah, um, if you all could just kind of talk about what you think some of the whereases and conclusions therefore would, would be. So before we start to do that, I know that officer, um, before we do that, I, just, just one thing, Paul, are you still on the call, Paul Goldstein? Yes, Paul is still here. Officer Nelson, we had a question that was not about this, and I know I, I want to let you go, and I would like to let Captain Chang go if you two would like to before the committee starts to discuss it. So, Paul, if you could just ask your question to Officer Nelson before we start. You're calling on me, Paul Goldstein, right? Paul Goldstein, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. All right, I won't be long because I you have a lot of important business. Um, Officer Nelson, um, I wanted to see if I could work with you and people from the east side of the community uh, to deal with uh, some issues that have come up in the aftermath of that very tragic uh, killing of that young woman in the uh, fish market building. And we have heard that there's a connection between the perpetrators of that crime and homeless population on Fulton Street. And I've also been talking to the head of security at Southbridge, where I live. And uh, Andrew Jones has also said that uh, those that population has come around and tried to get into the buildings at Southbridge and they have to chase them out of the property. So anyway, there are issues and we think there's also a connection with um, some scaffolding on Fulton Street that has been there for years that really perhaps you could work with us and the owners of the building to get removed. So that's not such a popular spot. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Are you the right person at the precinct to uh, follow up with on this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, when I get back to the office, either later tonight or tomorrow morning, I will send you an email. I have your email from uh, an email chain that we're on together. I'll send you an email and uh, we'll discuss uh, a time we can meet, either meet next week or uh, set up a conference call next week. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, and thank you, Pat. 
You're quite welcome, Paul. See ya. See so now, um, Officer Nelson and Captain Chang, I want to thank you so greatly for coming out tonight. I know that you're doing multitasking there, Officer Nelson. <laughs> but sorry, Captain Chang, sorry, I wasn't one hundred percent attentive. Oh no, you answered questions. We, you were listening. So thank you both. And Ka and as you heard, Captain Chang, we're going to talk about you know a rezo from our community. Um, okay mayor's office all right and so Great, thank, you. thank you i hope that uh we can feel that we can reach out to you again in the future yes absolutely thank you so much for coming and spending your evening with us no, thank so you both of you stay safe stay safe out there thank okay, you have a good night, good take, night. Care. Thank you. Good night. take care our committee and, and and all of our guests thank you for coming also to join in the conversation um committee so, as Lucian said, um, first of all, do we need to, let's have a little discussion about whether we're all in favor of writing this reso. Yes. That asks for full funding of an um, Asian American task force, hate ta bias and hate task force. Um, I heard from Mitch. Just unmute. Yes, we should definitely. Yes, Bob Schnell. Okay. So I'm here, here in Bob, and there's Mariana. Yes, Francis. Francis. Yes. Burn. So we have Mimi, Rosa. Yes. Okay, we got a bunch of people Mariana. sitting. Okay, great. So since we pretty much all agree that we'd like to do this, what are some of the, uh, what are some of the whereas is, and, and you know, we'll, we'll. I have an idea, like like for one one little thing, and I wanted to ask you. Uh, just like they have the bids, like you know, the business improvement districts, that 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 they have those in Chinatown and some of the different areas. Is that the correct? Well, bids are business improvement. Uh, Do they have bids? Yeah, there is like, one in Chinatown for sure. Okay, so then then just like you know, like like in Midtown, in just like they have the the ambassadors in Battery Park City, and I know some of those plazas in Midtown, like around Grand Central Station, you'll see if, if you're walking there, you'll see some of those. You know, like security type of helpers that are kind of like patrolling around, making sure there's nobody urinating in the plaza and, and all that type of stuff. You know, I haven't really seen that in Chinatown, and it would seem that like whether the city could fund it or somehow like like the, the you know these task forces get the funding that that might be you know non police type of like. But Mitch, I'm sorry to cut you off, um, but we're asking for the mayor to fully fund a task force, that a permanent task force, and this would be their sole purpose would be to investigate and you know help help to bring well, charges. What do you think about ambassador? Just like we have in Battery Park City, what do you think about thirty or forty ambassadors walking around Chinatown for making people feel a little more safe, like they do in Battery Park City? Okay, but I think it's a separate issue. I'm not saying it's not a good issue. I'm just saying it's separate from asking for a fully funded task force. Oh, I'm sorry. So the the uh, we're just talking about like supporting a fully funded task force. I thought you were asking for some ideas about like things that could be accomplished. No, like, I'm sorry. Ideas about the rezo. I'm sorry. Like to... That's okay. That's all right. That's fine. Okay. I may not have made it clear. So I see Justine jump in. Well, I sort of would think that my my. I'm torn. Clearly, something has to be done. The, the crimes against the Asian people, whether it's harassment or actually physical touching and harm to people's physical bodies, is, is not acceptable. So something has to be done. Um, I kind of like where Mitch is going with the idea. So if we're going to do it, if we're going to ask for a task force, I would like that task force to be made up of more than just police. I would like it to be made up of, um, we could ask for it to be some mental health people. And also, um, whether the mental health people who or whatever the agency would be would be there to, to deal with if it, either the victims or the perpetrators because some of the stuff that don lee said was very disturbing 13 year olds i mean my god they're children yeah. and they're doing this um i i can't be the one to say i i don't know i my brain is off on this task force that would be made up of the police to do investigations and you know, so I I'm not sure. So so I guess that what what is that? Maybe someone who could explain to me. Of course, my idea, when you say task force, I think of like um, oh God, 
Chicago PD or something where it's like this little group of people that are only focused on, you know, police officers, yeah, obviously, yeah. only focused yeah. on that. But they're, yes. they're out in the street and they're doing that. Okay. Yes. That's what they're doing. Because as Captain Chang said, they right now it is just they're just volunteers. They're officers oh, wow. hearing. And that <laughs> is hard. They're doing their job. I think I heard Mariama want to say something. They're doing their job and they're doing this. So no, being nice could have, it be part of their job, that would be great. I agree with that. So so well, I mean, maybe that. Some, go on and they would be assigned to that task force. But but, but I guess maybe if we're opining as to what as to asking for a task force. It might be a way, or it might be a good idea to see what people, if they agree with me, is to ask for more than just. So clearly the task force is going to be there to investigate the crimes, find the perpetrators, perhaps. Uh, I don't see them being a, a group of people, unless you correct me that I'm wrong. We this have, group of five or six people, if you're if you're lucky, they're not going to be out there patrolling the streets. They're going to be out there solving the crimes. Well, we don't, it's not up to us to determine how many people are on the task force or yeah. how many task force and then after you know after obviously as in any investigation after it's investigated and the perpetrators are found and charged then the da takes over you know right. then it's, but it's, pat on the task force though we can if p if the other board members agree like justine said we can like in our reso say that the task force while maybe predominantly by law enforcement officials should also be have some other type of social pro, uh, professionals included in the task force because they're, they're working it's not like a like the uh the uh, civil liberties good. union working against the police union this is like like group a group no of but maybe we need mental health people because yeah, that's what i'm trying to say yeah mental health people maybe maybe like some type of a, a civil a, 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 a lawyer that's sympathetic to the the, the police and the the community and then with the majority I Obviously, it from from the the police organization, but uh, not just from the police organization. Like I'm saying, it's I don't think it's up to us to totally define what it is and who makes it up. But I think we could ask for you know specifically some mental health or some other um, other. Uh, I think we could ask for what the, what we want to ask. I mean, assuming everybody agrees to it, what we want to, what they do with that is up to them. Obviously, because it's their purview and they've got to make the decisions that make the most sense. Oh, and, 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 and who else wants question. to I, I, Yeah, yeah. I, I I agree with what you guys are saying. I think that if we say police task force, then that is going to be we don't have interpreted to. as just a group of police officers. So I think that, if, that I think if you're wanting to do something else or we're wanting to do something else to create Something else that doesn't exist right now, then we have to sort of outline that without over um, instructing, you know, right. the powers yeah. that be as to how to create it. Well, I think the question was as to what what exists currently. Because I, I know the attorney general, uh, when the uh, crimes began months back, um, or, or or they began a long time ago, but when at the height of it, I guess it was around the summer. The attorney general had created something then um, out of the police department, and I'm just did that go away or? Um, I don't know. Is, is, was it temporary? Like what exists now? There is a volunteer task force that is part of the NYPD, but as Officer Chang explained, it is voluntary, so they are not allocated to the task force full time. In fact, they do it on top of their regular job, and so I think that the resolution needs to specifically state that we would like the city to fund for there to be a a task force that's dedicated to this exactly. issue and this issue alone and that these officers are not um forced to choose between working on the task force or their actual paid right. position so, so that's the voluntary the volu this voluntary core to what you're referring is what leticia james created because that's what i'm talking about the attorney general created I can't, something we'd have to look it up we'd have to okay. research, just, i don't know can i just I, share yeah. something with you guys that might contribute to a whereas because there's this new york times article that i was reading um and it just i'm just going to quote it first before i go to the uh to the actual title of it and it's from today among large American cities, New York City had the largest increase in reported hate crimes against Asians last year, 
According to an, an analysis of police data by a center at the California State University, San Bernardino, there are 28 such incidents in 2020, up from three in 2019, according to New York Police Department data. Um, and that article is from today, and I don't know what the numbers are so far this year, and it's called Asian Americans are being attacked. Why are hate crime charges so rare? And it's rising. It's not like it's stopping. And no, that no, sounds yes, like, a, like a good part of the resolution. That's certainly yes. a whereas. Yes. Uh, okay, so Lucian, you still there? I'm here. Okay, I mean, Bob, did you want to say something yeah, else? Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment, a follow on to, uh, uh, to Mitch um, and to Justine. Uh, the um, ambassadors are hired by the Battery Park City Authority, which is the bid for Battery Park City. There is a bid in Chinatown, and it it isn't as well funded, but it is where you could actually have a small cadre of social workers and um, and psychological help. And it would be if it's something that we asked for, it it could be affordable. Margaret Chin helped to form the bid in Chinatown, and she was very involved with that. And the person that is uh, Wellington Chan, who's the person in charge of that, is a very capable person. And he's a person that we could call into uh, the Quality of Life Committee and 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 talk to him about this and what's possible. Uh, the bid, my understanding is that bids are supported by the businesses that pay dues into the bid. And is that not, isn't that correct? It, it's a, an assessment that's like a tax on the uh, commercial properties. Yeah. And so we're talking about asking the city, asking the mayor to fund a task force. But besides the operating no, fund. Like that, we can ask the bid to do it too. Like I, but, um, but the bid has, the, you know, I mean, the city has no we Well, the city has no control over how the bid spends its money. So, but separate from that, why can't we also at least take Bob's suggestion and at least ask the separate, Wellington? Separate. I don't, I'm not saying no. I'm just saying separate right so now. If I can make a yeah, and, I, and I agree that it's separate. What I'm saying is that there's a what we're looking after is what's needed in the community, and okay. what and Mitch is talking about, and what Jean is, uh, Justine is talking about, is an aspect of this that's needed. Certainly, we need to handle the crime and cr criminality part of this. That's right. what the, the police department does, and so that's we what we're asking that. for in the resolution. As a follow-on, we can call Wellington in and talk yeah. about this other stuff. And, and that's, that's the suggest. That's my suggestion. Okay, and so we will definitely send. Can you just jot down a little note so that we can do that? But this is totally like in the next five minutes because we have two more topics. Can we just focus? Pat, totally can I read you what I have here? Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, I have the Asian Hate Crime Task Force allows detectives from across the city to collaborate on identifying and solving hate crimes committed against people of Asian descent and the detectives um, of this task force are contributing their time on a voluntary basis, and the work is not part of the regularly assigned detail. And in addition to cultural sensitivity, the task force improves the process of interviewing crime victims or victims of crimes by matching them with detectives that speak their native languages. And so those are the three whereas's that I have. Um, I think that um, I heard a couple of people talk about uh, uh, referring to their voluntary detail and saying it should be made as a as a permanent detail, yes. allowing for for permanent members to do that as their primary assignment. Um, yes. That's I can elaborate on that uh, as a as a therefore be it resolved. Um, that's one thing I heard that based on what was discussed, um, and that would that would be you know part of the budget discussion that would need to be like a line item. In the city budget, how we have the operating operating budget. Um, those are things that I can I can say for sure based on what I've heard. Sounds good. If, if this fits in, I'm sorry. Um, can we, Betty? I, I'm sorry, Betty. We'd we'd also like to ask if they can be supported by uh, like me mental health um, um, specialists. I think that's what we were asking. Also, I don't know how you fit that into the. I'm sitting in. Rest. Yeah, I'm, but, I'm putting something in. Miss K. 
Yeah, I was going to add the other comment that was made uh, by the person who'd been the assistant district attorney. If there could be something, another therefore be it resolved, that the district attorney's office work with the task force or is a funded force about ways to deal with these hate crimes against the Asian community. Very good point, I think. Got it, Lucia? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry, Mariama. Did Mariama have a point? You had a point, right, Mariama? Well, I was. I wanted to know from where we were starting, uh, you know, to, in order to be able to contribute. But I went ahead and looked it up on my own of what Letitia James had created, and it was in fact um, a hotline specific to Asian um, hate crimes. Okay. So I, I lo it looks like we are starting fresh, and we can sort of design it as we wish, or or attempt to at least. And we really should see if Tammy. I think Tammy's gone. Tammy, you still here? If Tammy can take it to. Do you agree that if we can at all incorporate uh, mental health uh, and or you know um, a social? Um, I think there has to be a, a social component to it. I don't know what that is, so I don't know how we do that, how we ask, and but I do think we do know mental health. Mental and health. I don't know if you mean like a social worker it, or it, I mean, a social it, worker. It, it may even be a social worker, but that, yeah. sometimes you're gonna you're gonna when you're dealing with immigrants, you're going to experience that they need somebody um, to talk to the police with them or to to make them feel comfortable to even do it. Yeah. You know, you know, Pat, can I just say something like I agree with Mariana 100% and the analogy I'm going to make is, you know, when God forbid a relative or somebody's in the hospital and, you know, there might be a little like snafu somewhere and they assign yeah. a social worker to you and then upon discharge, the social worker kind of arranges some of the other things that now are out of the hands of the doctors and the doctors are, are putting out the doctors of the policemen. So to have a social worker to maybe handle some of the other minutia that's not minutia to the to the victim's family, but minutia to what the detectives are looking at might not be a bad idea. And also as Captain Chang, to, I mean, to kind of help ease the re-trauma that the right. victim is suffering, you know? Right, it shouldn't be a requirement for the task force like that. Well, if we don't get that, then we don't want a task force, but just a recommendation that it would be nice right. to be included in the task force. Okay. Let Lucian um, figure out how to add it in there. Okay. And then- We can, ask for it to be included, like that language. Not demand, right. but ask. Right, is there anything else that anyone feels we should, uh, Include in our rezo. Vera, are you still here? Is Vera here? Yeah, I'm Pat. Yeah, I've heard. Every, I've been listening to everybody, and I think, any anything um, Vera that you'd like to see. Anything else you'd like to see included? No, I um I I just want to make sure what Rosa said was being included. That it's 833 percent increase in um. um yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, Lucian, you got <laughs> that right. I do. Did you get it, Lucian? I did. Okay, yes, he did. So, okay, so we can, uh, and and we can talk some more. So, do we feel like we have the more than bare bones, that we actually have a really good start to this rezo? It doesn't need to be flushed out that much more. But Lucian and I will will discuss tomorrow, and, and Miriama, okay? All right, so can we vote on this, please? Yes. Can we, yeah. can we call the question? Huh. Oh, oh. Call the question. <laughs> okay. I, I heard call the question, but who before you called the question? Was it Lucian or was it a. No, somebody okay. was somebody was saying second the motion before the question okay. was called. Yeah, so let's do it the way we've been doing. If there's anyone opposed, please let us know. Anyone who wants to abstain, please let us know. If I don't hear any of those, then I would assume that everyone is in favor of our rezo. Okie dokie, thank you. So, thank you. Thank you, Lucian. You and I can talk tomorrow and Mariama, okay? Yep. So now, Mariama and Justine, you're on. Okay, Lucian, can you pull up the um, resolution, please? That I hope people, Absolutely. people on board have read. Yes, yeah. Say again. Sorry. So, so we will be talking, trying to, you know, round two. 
thanks to the help of, um, of Jeff Galloway, who helped us kind of um, narrow down the focus and make it a little bit clearer. What we wanted to make this resolution do and say is to point out that there's one little gap for co-op and condos. And Mary, I'm so, you know, interrupt me when I get this wrong, but there's a gap with co-ops and condos in terms of Fairs Act protection. And it's because only co-ops and condos have the um, interesting, if you want to call it, or the, or the unique um, responsibility of jointly caring for and financing their buildings. So you're not only worried about your own your own pocketbook, but you're worried about your neighbor's pocketbook and in different levels of um, you know, different variations of that, depending on whether it's a co-op or a condo. What we're right, doing, right. As, as well as the corporation's uh, pocketbook. Yes, yeah. the corporation. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so in the simplest of terms with regard to the CARES Act, all of all the different variations of residential you know, tenancy are covered with the exception of co-ops and condos. So there is relief for private, you know, single family homeowners. There is relief for renters. You know, there is different types of, there's mortgage forbearance and there's, um, you know, zero rate mortgages. There is uh, protection from foreclosure. There's rent money, you know, and will the state will step in and, and work with your landlord and take care of them instead of you. Where there's all these things. Is a little bit of, of parity in terms of home o homeowners in co-ops and condos because the gap is coming in the situation when with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac mortgage companies, they're federally backed loans. And it's not the problem for the actual homeowner themselves, but it, what it does is it, it, unless in this part right here, we talk about it, we talk about warrantability. So basically co-ops or condos that meet the qualified lending requirements of Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac are considered warrantable. And buyers who want to purchase a solution, you didn't change to the one that I Fix. This is type, the typo in here. Bottom that that one paragraph that I'm reading. Um, so, uh, darn it, I'll have to find it and get it to you. Bottom line though is buyers who want to buy a warrantable condo or co-op, they want to do that because it gives them as the buyer better terms and conditions and a better you know cheaper mortgage basically. And as you're going into something, who doesn't want it to be cheaper? So if you have a building that is not warrantable and cannot get a, a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac warrantability, uh, they can't get loans that are that are um, certified by Freddie Mae and Fannie Mac, you basically are putting yourself in the position of only being able to sell to um, cash buyers. Why does that matter? Why do we care? Well, we care because right now during the pandemic, what has happened is there are people who've lost their jobs and may be co-op or condo owners. In the process of, of losing their jobs, not only can they not possibly pay their mortgage and they're getting mortgage forbearance, that's great, that happened with the CARES Act, but part of their obligation as a co-op or condo owner is to pay um, monthly maintenance charges towards the care and uptake of their building. The, the board of that building or the, or the management company of that building is controlling that money and using that money to pay salaries, pay it, uh, taxes, pay whatever the hell they have to pay, but that's there. The way the buildings are run and what we're asking for in this um, resolution is to look at the management companies of co-ops and condos and see these, I'm sorry, I'm trying to make my little buckets. And the way that the, the finances are put together is you've got an operating um, bucket, which is where the, for the most buildings, that's where your common charges are gonna get paid into. And then you also have your, cap, your capital budget. What we are asking for is not to have Freddie and Fannie Mae relax any um, uh, get qualifications for the buyer. The buyer still has to jump through all the hoops. They have to be eligible for right, the Nothing with regard to credit worthiness of a buyer. Yes, exactly. So we're not doing that. We're not trying to we're not trying to go back to the 2007, 2008, whatever it was. We're not looking for My junk God. loans or junk loans. We're not looking for that. What we're looking to do is ask Freddie Mae and Freddie Mac to um, relax for the duration of the of the pandemic okay. until we're done, there are accounting requirements. Because a lot of these buildings, what's happening is the operating budget is 
depleted because people are either not able to sell their apartments. So that money, if that is coming into it, into a co-op or a condo, or people are not paying their, their monthly bills. Maybe they're making the mortgage, but they're, or they're making nothing, but they're not paying those costs. And so the operating expenses, and the operating budget falls below what is required by Freddie Mae and Fannie Mac, whatever the hell it's called, to be considered warrantable. What we're saying is, no, look at the whole finances of the building. Look at their uh, at their capital costs. If they are financially stable as in their capital budget, still let them be considered warrantable until the pandemic's over. Once that's done, no, you can't. This can't go on forever. But until the pandemic is over, that is the gist of this this um, resolution. Does anybody have questions? I'm hoping people read it because it really is in there better. And Lucian, I'm going to I'll put in the chat the correct language for the because it's it's it, I just typoed it and I did that. Anybody have any questions, Maria? May we take charge while I find this? Uh, this is Michael Fetchering. Um you're going to hear me say something I don't say very often. I think it's a very clear and excellent resolution. It's no surprise once you told me our friend yes. Jeff Galloway was involved in drafting it. Uh, I'd be prepared to support it immediately. I think it's it's it 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 it's like you say it doesn't it doesn't give individual borrowers uh, a lower standard. It simply allows their units to be a little bit more marketable because uh, of the units can be it can be sold it can be sold because of the warrantable status and that helps and and co-ops do i i the former owner of a co-op myself they do rely on the on the flip taxes to you know fund building operations so if there's they're able to sell less units it's going to be to their detriment so uh, again i think i think it's an excellent resolution and i fully support it thank you michael i appreciate that i think that uh... thank you michael yeah, Mariam appreciates that, and I'm sure Jeff appreciates that too. Because yes, Pat had the wonderful idea of yeah of asking us <laughs> out uh, as... Jeff in to you know, someone with fresh eyes that's not on the committee that's very smart. That and and who doesn't own a condo or co-op, so this is this stuff was new to him, so it had to be. We wanted to make it so it was understandable to people who are not living yeah, this. Yeah. So thank you. Um, anybody else have questions? I did send it to the body. I I want to make oh. a comment. I I was unhappy with. The last version of this, and I'm a co-op owner or I'm a condo owner, and mm -hmm. I want to express what Kettering just did, which is I think this is much clearer. It's more obvious how this works and why you did it, and 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 that it's then it's vetted by two lawyers makes me feel a lot better. So it's a terrific thing. So thank you. No, thank you, Greg. Excellent. Thank you. Um, anybody else want to say something? Um, if not, can we get a vote on the hat? We have Hannah Wienerman of Congressman Nadler's office. Her hand is up. Email. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's great. And I'm sorry, I'm still playing with my email to send Lucian the body to change. Lucian? Yes. Can you make Hannah a panelist? Sure, let me bring up the window. Thank you. Anna, you should be able to mute yourself now. Hi, everyone. Um, I just wanted just to quickly hop on. Um, this draft looks wonderful. I So once the um, committee votes on it and then if it passes the full board, I'd be more than happy to take it to our legislative team and the congressman. So what I wanted to do kind of now is um, if we, we want to set up some time, maybe at the end of next week to touch base, um, Justine and Mariam and whomever else you want to that think it might be helpful, um, I'll loop in our uh, legislative folks so that we can start getting this moving because I know that it's something that's weighing on your mind um, for the past few months and we want to make sure that um, if there is a solution. I also want to check with our team to make sure that the American Rescue Plan doesn't do anything to modify what were the provisions in the CARES Act. So we'll also look on the back end too, but I just wanted to throw that out there because I know that this has been a long, long process. And so I just want to make sure that um, the Congressman, uh, to share that the Congressman's office is more than happy to uh, get this moving through the uh, appropriate channels. 
Thank you so much, Hannah. I mean, your, your office is tremendously busy. We all know, we see you on you guys on TV every day. Uh, so yeah. I really, really appreciate you. you guys taking the time out to work on this for us. Very much so, thank you. And thanks, Lucian, you got it. Thank you so much. And if people just read that, but um, I think that just makes more sense. I think I just had it incorrectly. And Betty, thank you for your help and, and Francis. I'm looking for hands. Are there any other questions on this or comments? Rosa's not on our committee, but Rosa, are you still here? Oh. I don't see, I see Rosa. Oh, this here. Yeah, it's here. Rosa, did you get a yes. chance to read it? I'm sort of I'm seeing it on the screen. <laughs> Oh, so you did, okay, oh, you did. she didn't maybe see it because if she wasn't on the committee, I didn't send but, it to her. I'm sorry, no, no, I'm not on the committee. Well, okay, well, we'll be interested next Tuesday when we have our full board meeting. Rosa, if, if you can't see on the screen, if you go to the live.mcb1.nyc, there's it's a link been... to see exactly what I'm showing on the screen. Oh, okay. Can you share the link in the chat or, or with the members? Are you with the panelists only? Are you able to do that? Um, yeah, okay. You'll have to give me one second. Um, and that's what you're working off of right now. So this new language is in there. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Sorry about that. Do we want to go ahead and vote on this? Or we want to wait a, a little while, let people look it up and read it? I think we're all in agreement. This thing is good. For you. Yeah, let's. Okay. I, say, I call the question. I second. Second. Can okay. we do it the way we're doing it? If there's anyone opposed? Um, and one who's abstaining. If not, we're going to assume that everyone's in favor. And Rosa, after you get a chance to look at it, and if you have any little tweaks that you think, you know, please send it to um, Justine and Mariama so they can decide whether they want to take a friendly amendment. Friendly suggestion. All right, so <laughs> we're we're a go. Yes. Yeah, I think so. Right. Thank you, Mariama. Well, thank Justine. you, guys. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks for putting hey. up us. So you know, you're it ready. Down and making it sensible. You'll, Thank you'll you. explain it again on Tuesday at the full board meeting. Right? So last item on our agenda, everybody. We're heading heading home. Lucian, you were going to introduce us to the mayor's proposals for um, changes in the charter. Certainly. Um all right, let me pull up this document. Does everyone have that document? I'm trying to find mine now. Where did it go? All right, so this is also available uh, from a link on live.mcb1.nyc, uh, just under the title of the meetings. I added, I, I believe I added a link to um, to this. Uh, if it's not there, let me know and I'll, I'll double check. Um, the purpose of tonight is to prepare uh, both the members of the committee and the public um, for some um, future uh, uh, hearings, review charter review commissions um, that are centered around a number of proposals that the mayor made at his state of the city um, remarks uh, for 2021. And there is altogether, it's a package of proposed uh, changes to both the operation of the police department and the civilian complaint review board, uh, also known as CCRB. Um, the members, um, since there's no active hearing, um, the format of which comments are to be received is unknown or unclear at this point. So we have time to familiarize, familiarize ourselves with this being proposed and also ask ourselves what other information do we need to uh, research or to request in order to have a really full picture of, uh, uh, of uh, what we need to actually discuss this uh, in earnest when, when the time does come. So this is our due diligence uh, to be prepared. Um, and so I want to go through each of these uh, items and then uh, ask the committee sort of what follow up questions would they have uh, in terms of to, uh, uh, 
information that's lacking or that needs clarity. Um, that way I can either A, um, see if the mayor's office is able to um, further develop what these mean uh, or uh, fill in the gaps of information, or B, uh, we could conduct our own research um, to see if other cities have done similar things and what the results have been. Um, that way we have an apples to apples comparison. Um, does everyone understand kind of how how this process is can run tonight? No. So <laughs> I want sorry. you all to I, I want to go over each of these items and you tell me what questions that you have, what questions are evoked from uh, from the statement, from these proposals. And I'm going to take these questions down and then we can work on doing research based on that. So when the okay. process does come, we'll we'll be even more prepared. But it's not for us to come up with a, a position on it tonight, but rather uh, understanding what it is that we don't know or understand. Um, and that way we can be more prepared to discuss this when they, they do need our input. Because some of these things may not come back up. Um, you know, he's the, the mayor's term is, you know, he has less than a year. Some of these processes may be started before he leaves office. Uh, and then he'll leave office. So it's unclear how this is going to work. Charter review, revision commissions take a long time. Um, it, our experience is, you know, guided by the, the most recent two charter revision commissions, one which in, implemented uh, uh, community board uh, uh, term limits, uh, and that was put on the ballot. So, you know, this is something that could end up on the ballot. Um, this year, or maybe something that's he's kicking down to the next mayor. It's unclear what's going to happen. So anyway, with that, I'm going to just run through these and then um, I am going to take notes. You'll see the notes that I put uh, and any kind of questions. So the first one, Charter Revision Commission. Um, let's see. So no, the, the, yeah, do you want to read these out, Pat? I was going to say, do you want me to read them and you take the notes? Yeah. Okay, sure. So I'm going to have to switch. Yeah, yeah, but go ahead. We're just going to give it from the beginning, like give communities a voice in choosing precinct commanders, right? So the mission of neighborhood policing is to strengthen the bonds between community and police, and New York City is taking historic steps to deepen those bonds in 2021. Beginning this year, communities will have a direct role in selecting the NYPD Precinct commanders, New York City will empower local community members to not only perform annual evaluations of commanding officers' performances, but also help select precinct commanders from the start. Precinct councils will hold interviews of NYPD's proposed candidates for precinct commanders and provide the NYPD with feedback on the candidates. Following the selection of a new precinct commander, the panel will have an ongoing relationship with the commanding officer and will evaluate their general effectiveness, engagement with the larger community, and responsiveness to issues raised by the community. And so I had Justine and, and Mariama and I actually had a little conversation about this, and then I had a conversation, a little conversation with Lucian <coughs> earlier that I would like to know what kind of information we're going to be given to help us evaluate, you know, whether these potential precinct commanders, how do we know that we want them? How do we know, how can we choose between one and the, we don't know them. They're police Isn't officers, we're not, none of us are police. I, it, I read something very recently. It appears they're doing this in two different, borough, two different precincts in Brooklyn right now. So mm -hmm. it would make sense to see from them what their real experience is, because that's what the NYPD. Okay, so that's that okay. may well be, but there's also groups out there also, first, can I ask Lucian to scroll up so we can see what you just read? But, um, but secondly, um, there's groups out there that kind of have done the research. I mean, it's from a different perspective. They're not police groups, but they're community groups that have done some research. And it would be interesting to have them come with some guidance too. So I agree with you, Pat, that it, it's from from a um, in a vacuum. How do we know who to pick? We don't know. Um, yeah, we but. Yeah. But it's almost like where, how do we know who to, who to pick for a district leader or um, a okay, mayor or whatever, whatever offices are there. Well, we have a pool. They have to, they have to internally present us with a pool of people is what I would say. It's not only pool 
people, we need histories. We need, you know, we need well, to yes. know the records are. I, I said to Lucian, I mean, it would make more sense to me to vote, to be able to vote on a commissioner than on and, a precinct commander. But, oh, but I would want to do both. I know it's a lot of work, but I would want to do both. And I think it's great, uh, the idea of a commissioner, too. Well, but they're not asking for that. So they're not asking for that. Yeah, I'm sure they're not. But the, but the precinct the commander would make sense. And, okay, ongoing relationship. I, mean, I like what they're saying in terms of ongoing. But, right. but, but that's after you select. And be, so before yes. you select, I need to have, I would want to know, well, where am I getting this information from? How, what kind of information are you giving me to select from, you know, is it three people? Well, maybe or that's two? one of our questions is to ask them when and tell them what information we want to have. Right. I assume. I mean, like you said, their records, their length right. of time, where do they live? I mean, you know, yeah. I like the whole idea of having They're people mad. live in the, in the have city. Have they been mad? before have they you know anyway um anybody yeah. else have anything to say about this particular item no nope. i yes. was let's see i just wanted to say that um it's these we have a personnel committee in the in cb1 and it's a lot of work to even make small decisions like that right. and so right. it's kind of like uh, does this, does the initial vetting for these things belong in something like our service commit subcommittee or, you know, should there be some initial vetting and then are we going to interview the people and who's going to interview them and what it's kind of internal process board. are we going to have to do this? But Bob, it doesn't say community board members either. It doesn't say community board members are going to make the decisions. It says community. And so yeah. what does that mean? Like how many, who are we going to, how are you going to run this voting on how, you know, we don't know anything. This is nothing as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, it's a very <laughs> vague, nonsensical thing. But I think if we ask good questions, we might be able to, to, Right. So, to, One question we can down. ask is whether or not the community board is involved with this, and to what extent is it involved with this? And but I like the, with the community in coming to a final decision. But I like the idea, Bob, of having the community board as a representative of the community um, be involved in something like this because it matters. I mean, you know, we talked earlier about systemic um, privilege and white whatever, white privilege, whatever the hell we talked about in terms of racism. And if we're going to be looking at the police and asking them to do better, they need to talk to us about how we'd like them to do better. And this is this is a olive branch yeah. out to say, hey, we want to hear what you have to say. So we should be asking the questions. So For one thing, if if the community board is really on board with uh, community policing, then this is a really important part of that because the the really cornerstone job in a precinct is is the commander and to have something you know real input to that's really important that's why we have the monthly precinct meetings and things so i you know i think that the real question is does the community board want to have take some kind of real stand in this and have some real kind of voice in it and the question for us is if we do want to stand in that kind of um relationship what kind of stand do we you know what how big a piece, how much energy are we going to throw into this or even offer? Anybody else? Anything like in lieu of the public, right? I, maybe I interpreted it incorrectly. Okay. I don't know. Bob might be saying in lieu of. I'm not saying in lieu of. But it sounded like the mayor's intention was to have like more a larger scope of public engagement, right? Not limited specifically to the community board. Right. I think that's have, better. I mean, I'm not saying the community, community board members. shouldn't have a, a position as well if there's an opportunity for somebody to be like a member of a of a you know reconvening panel, reoccurring panel or something. I would support that. But um for for the community board to just be the voice of oh, no, the people, I don't think so. I'm, I'm not really Okay. All right. Yeah, I, I agree, Miriam. Uh, anybody else? Okay. So that one, I'll go on to the next one, which you may you may have already. This, this first one uh, looks like a preamble, but it's um, this is actually one as well. This one's okay. kind of super broad. The first uh, item, the Charter Revision Commission, it looks kind of like a like a intro, but 
uh, I read it again, and this is actually a, a, a proposal that's very open ended. You mean the David Dinkins CCRB? No, the uh, in order to, the Charter Revision Commission. It's the very, the very top of the document. Um, I put a link in the chat. Sorry, uh, I. I, I thought I'd updated the uh, the website with the link to all the documents and uh, Taylor point out that I hadn't done so yet. So thank you, Taylor. Um, I updated the website and they also put a link in the chat. So okay. it reads in order to build a recovery for all of us in New York City's future, we must also address the pain of the past. Starting this year, Mayor de Blasio is naming a charter revision commission that will focus on racial justice and reconciliation. The commission will have a two year mandate to identify areas of structural racism in New York City and recommend changes that will root out this systemic rot. In the new commission, New York City can lead the way in America by speaking openly of the wrongs of the past, create, creating new approaches to right those wrongs, and enshrining this progress into law. I wish you'd given us an idea as to of whom by, you know, this, this commission would be made, because when we're appointing the wrong people, I mean, just just what a month ago in New York City, oh, we had the head of the racial the racism department of the NYPD was a white supremacist, you know. So we're, we're putting the wrong people in these jobs. I wish you'd given us some sort of indication as to you know from from where we'd be getting these people who would make up this this group. Because if it's just going to be, you know, if, if just appointing people that the mayor deems appropriate by whatever means that is. Uh, it, it, you know, it may just amount to a bunch of lip service and waste of money. Okay, but yeah. Miriam, that's your, that's your that's your suggestion then that we have some say in the people who are appointed to the um, Charter Revision Commission, right? Yes. Okay. So, yes. I think I agree. I think the community should be involved. I think that that, that there are are groups that are actively pursuing racial justice. They should be tapped. Now, whether or not their people are chosen from there, but they should certainly be invited to the table. And and the mayor's office and and I guess could vet them to see you don't want people I suppose who are going to be unable you can't work with but you have to have new ideas this whole thing that they're, they're speaking broadly and and they're talking about getting rid of systemic rot that's really good because so, I mean, the, the main thing is like we should say we're just trying to ask questions about these statements that are being made. So that we can get more information. Okay. So when the time comes, if indeed the charter revision happens, we will have some information to work All right. from. All so, right. though, so Mariama's suggestion was, you know, good that we we need to know who's going on the revision, the uh, commission. And Anybody? I I want to add that um, that we we have some elements of our committee working on this. And we would like to find out how we could give input to that commission over time or how, how yes. we could structure some kind of involvement with it and how they could give us some information, you know, give us a normal flow of information to work with about how they're doing. And then we can have responses and also tell them what we're doing. For the commission, the people. Yeah, who are I mean, how do we provide input to them? Okay. Yeah. Any other? Yeah, I think so. We have what Mariama said about um, who the question. Okay, so who is going to be on the Re Charter Revision Commission? Right. That was her question, right? I mean, and are you including are you including groups like Beyond Police Working Group? Um, there's another group, but I can't think of what it's well, called. Beyond the Police, it's. A commission, you know, a revision to the to the charter. It doesn't. Well, well, that's it, actually the name of a group beyond the police working. I mean, that that that's a group that exists. Um, but I, they don't need to have police. Oh yeah. Oh, I see. It's a group that exists. It's okay. a group that exists at least to invite them to the table to get their input. Okay. And maybe not that one. I just can't think of another name right now. There's other. There's right. so many out there. All right. We we'll visit we, this again. Could we request that somebody from the community board be um, the designated yeah. liaison to that would be this great. charter revision commission? And then that way that would sort of resolve what Bob was saying, which is that we have one designated person at least who sort of, you know, keeps us up to date on what's going on there now, and also this, represents our perspective. But this commission, when you say, uh, that was Rosa, right? When you say yeah. yes. somebody community board, um, the commission is going to be citywide, so it's it not needs going to be one person from every community board, I think. 
Yes, exactly. Well, well in the past. But I would thought it's 59 people. Yeah, that's a lot. That's but a lot. I think it needs to be. Yeah. We're talking about a, a huge change to the police department. We're not just talking about the police department, though. We're not just talking about the police department. This is very broad. This Charter yeah. Revision Commission is, they're basically saying, you know, this is the kind of the general subject. Mm -hmm. so, so just to give you guys an idea of how this worked in the past, for the last Charter Revision Commission, they said, well, okay, how do we make elections more fair? And so they had a big hearing. Well, number one, uh, each pro president had an appointment, an appointment they could make. Um, mm. the, uh, uh, public advocate, the mayor had a certain number, the city council speaker had a certain number. I can't remember exactly what the what the recipe was and, and how the balance was made. Of course, the mayor has you know the majority of the of the of the seats, and then the the um, the I'm sorry, people are talking next to me. And then um, they have a hearing. The public all comes in and says, this is what we think you should look at. And so they take all the input and they say, okay, from what we heard, these are the buckets that we're going to look at. And so for each bucket, they do some research and then people come in and they like have another hearing and then people submit their testimony to each of those buckets. And then they kind of keep narrowing it down until they start <laughs> fleshing out actual language of how what parts of the charter and then what the the language changes that should be made and at the end those are voted on by the commissioners and then what kind of passes muster is included in a like a plebiscite uh so when the general election occurs um the the the, the voters of new york in addition to voting for the mayor and any other elected officials can vote on the the proposed changes to the charter so you know in terms of like you know adding like a at large community seat or a seat that is held by you know a representative of a reform advocate whether it's police reform or social justice reform you know that's certainly something that you know is worth you know seeing if that's possible um uh you know because that's yeah, I, I think that there's no necessary um, uh, uh, required formula of, of how who gets appointments and the like, and I think it's an interesting idea. Um, but you know, I just want to give you a sense of how how it ran, well, not to say that it's gospel. Right. So our, first, so our first suggestion is who or what we're interested in finding out is who they're going to they're thinking of appoint appointing and how they're going to choose who they appoint. And then our second information, bit of information is what Justine and Rosa were talking about, which is maybe they think about appointing someone, we can't say who, but someone from that represents the community board, you know? And so that's our, but we, can, you know, at this point, we're just committee, we're just asking questions. So can we just go on? Cause I'd like us to get out of here by nine. So can we go on to the next one, which is the David Dinkins plan, expand and strengthen the CCRB civilian um, review com uh, complaint review board? Yeah. And have, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I have a suggestion about the CCRB that it's completely and absolutely been ineffective because it's reporting to the police commissioner. It needs to be a separate. It needs to right. be a separate. A, a, it's separate. Um, I don't want to say agency, entity, something. It needs to be. In, it needs to be on its own. Can you see this? Uh, on I'm the looking screen? at it. I, I've opened up another. Like, yeah, I, I, I found the link, so I'm going. So they're, up. you know, they're saying expand totally what the CCRB can access and what they can investigate. Most importantly, if grants the CCRB the powers to uh, initiate their own investigations and they're but they do that now. I said the big joke. They do that now, and the police commission ignored. The police commissioner determines whether or not to proceed and right. to, you know, bring any charges or, or, or and, you know, the accept their recommendations or whatever. So I right. agree with Justine a thousand percent. It needs to be pulled from under the um, commissioner's jurisdiction. It's the oh, process right right there. Now. Right, right, that's, that would be our question is, will you consider, how about that? If you don't want to tell them what to do, will you consider pulling the CCRB outside of the okay, we read, read Read all of it. Allow CCRB to initiate their individual case investigations on its own without an individual yeah. compl compliant, right? Yeah. Guarantee access to body worn camera footage. We're supposed to be doing that now. Grant CCRB full access to officers. To, uh, they have that now. 
employment histories for sustained cases, gives CCRB authority to investigate individual instances of bias-based policing misconduct. And they so, do that now. Uh, but do they really? They, <laughs> they do. I mean, Pat, I guess what I want to let make it clear to you is the CCRB has huge files on people and presents yes. so many complaints forward. And then it is up to the police commissioner police to vet it. And the vet, the police commissioner throws it all out. Right. And so what I want away from coming back to the police commissioner. I mean, you could be a seat at the table. Out, cause, okay. cause what I, you want, I guess what you want to ask is. Will you take this outside? Yeah, away from the police commissioner. Away from and, the PD, yeah. And what establishing a um establish the patrol guide review committee. Okay, well that's different. So I guess you're just saying take it away from the police commissioner is what you're interested in finding out. But I mean we're just asking I don't questions. want NYPD oversight. I, I would like would they consider taking if, if they are truly committed, sorry, if I was writing this, if they're truly committed to making change. Would they consider moving the CCRB outside of the police? The okay. NYPD oversight. Would you consider? I wouldn't even if they consider. The fact is, to gain confidence of the citizens, they really Thank need you. to move it. Period. Uh -huh. what, what I'm hearing is you want to move. You want to move the decision for discipline out of the NYPD into the CCRB. I I don't I could be wrong, but I don't believe the CCRB is part of the NYPD. I think it's the NYPD has the oversight of them right now. The police commissioner has the jurisdiction to determine whether or not the, the, the crimes. Yeah, the right. Yeah. yeah. The okay. CCRB the, the, the police CCRB commissioner the and that means the NYPD has the final arbiter. Right. So, the CCRB so we want to make sure that, that the discipline exactly. decisions move to the CCRB. Right. Well, not necessarily moved to the CCRB, but removed from the police commissioner. Because, because they should have the final, the, the CCRB's decision should be final, and then it should go to the attorney general or whoever it is. It should go to the lawyers then at that point, the process, you know, and say, is there something here? Isn't there something here? But you take it away. If CCRB, it's basically like the cops that go out and say, okay, we made our case. Yeah, what are you going to do with it? Instead, what this is happening is, is we made our case. The, the police commissioner looks at it and says, "Yeah, not so much. No." And there's an even ever gets does never gets brought to the late light of day unless there's a video somewhere or someone's making a stink and well, and, yeah, yeah, and okay. that's not um, that's not good. Gonna, that, that's why we are where we are right now. Okay, we're going to go back to this again and again. That we have like ten minutes. I know. So, okay. That's okay. Lucian has that. Um, so establish a patrol guide review committee. The Dinkins plan would establish a patrol guide review committee to examine situations where no misconduct was found because the actions were within policy, but the policy itself was problematic. This will allow those in NYPD oversight to drive toward drive forward policy and promote further reforms directly in the NYPD. Everybody understands that? So the policy itself is what's wrong. So they're, they're proposing that this that's cool too would would look at and review the policies that are unjust mm -hmm. i think we can all agree with that i think we agree with that yep agree Any, yes i don't know what questions we have else? i have to think about what questions we'd have about it but that's yeah. right thank you justine yeah the i have some people who aren't saying anything or i mean are you in agreement or not in agreement or you have some questions or Diane, Mitch, Rosa, Michael, Fern. No? All right. Well, so, but the question relates to this. So we'll establish the patrol guard committee to examine situations. I follow it to perform. They're going to review policy. So, so I guess, how are we going to define, how are we going to determine which policies to look at? Uh, that would be a question. And I don't, I, I don't know, but that, that's, Right. Well, um, well, if yeah. we think if the citizens, I guess, find that something is is uh, is problematic, but yet they followed the policy, I guess it's like, you know, the chokehold, but the chokehold had been abandoned. We weren't supposed to use a chokehold. So I, I mean, that's probably but, a backward analogy. It, it, well, I know what you're saying, but the, but the problem is the chokehold was bad and it was bad for a really long time. 
it was banned also and it, and yet it was it banned was and they still were using it yeah but it took it took somebody looking at the children <laughs> and say, oh, it took Eric Garner dying to have someone look at it could we not right. go to, you know I mean that that was what okay. would be nice is for us and I think the whole point of what the police were trying to do with this or the mayor was trying to do with this is to not have it get to that point I don't right. want the public telling us when to do it do you have a question that yeah, you my ask? question was how do you determine what what is problematic where what what are their guidelines who's okay, looking at so, it uh, those are my questions okay. Who, who's making the determination for these things so basically have an answer. All, of our, all of our questions so far have more or less been who are the people that are going to be looking yeah. at this? who and what yeah right okay so um expand the ccrb to include the powers of the nypd OIG and the OIG was the Office of the Inspector General and the CCPC, which was the Commission to Combat Police Corruption. So, in the single largest structural change since the CCRB was formed, the Dinkins Plan will consolidate the, the Commission to Combat Police Corruption and the um, NYPD Office of the Inspector General under, it would all be under the CCRB. Now, I don't really know what the uh, NYPD Office of the Inspector General does, nor do I know what the Commission to Combat, I mean, they sound self-evident, but I don't really know what the Commission to Combat Police Corruption does, so I think we would have to invest, I don't know if somebody knows that, but I don't, and I think we would need to investigate what they do, who they are, how they work, have nobody they- know how they define corruption. Look at all the placard abuse that we have and nobody mm -hmm. does anything. Look at all the parking and bus lanes and no one does anything to their police. Yep. So is that corruption? Well, because they certainly okay. don't ignore it. So Betty yeah. is asking, how do we define corruption? Which I think is great. And that's and a good question. What these two agencies are, what they do, and why would they why would those two be under the CCRB? So I think those are questions. Any other questions about that? It says police oversight will be greatly strengthened by consolidating these existing oversight functions into a single body. The newly strengthened CCRB will have the combined authority to, to investigate complaints for the public and recommend discipline of officers, conduct regular audits of policing, internal discipline, and anti-corruption practices, conduct systematic reviews of the NYPD police and practices, including uh, uh, racially biased policing and make recommendations for reform, including publishing regular public records about complaint statistics and public tracking of progress on recommendations. So, Pat, can I, you just, can, Lucian, could you just scroll back a little to where Pat started reading? Where was I? Where, where um, Mitch? A little more, a little more. Yeah, the, the, the one sentence, just kind of like what you and Betty said, the one sentence that I'm just a little, have some apprehension about, police oversight will be greatly strengthened by consolidating these existing oversight functions to a single body, because now you have police over, over, oversighting themselves. I don't know if that's not a word, but you, you know what I mean. And it could be great if it's really like, you know, honest people. But like, you know, they're not going to give themselves tickets for placard parking, for example. I mean, you're just making an, an analogy like what Betty said. So, you know, it's always we need an to outside know. agency to, to investigate corruption from another agency. Okay, know. but that's why we need to know what the Commission to Combat Police Corruption does and what the Inspector General does mm -hmm. and why yeah. would strengthen it being under the CCRB, which is the civilian complaint review board why would it strengthen that and why how if since it is police why would it go i don't think we have enough information no. at least i don't have no. enough information to answer that's that that's what we're asking that those are the questions we're asking that's we're so asking for because i think information. i think that what i think what this is doing is i think that the, it, it, the, it's written poorly i think that they're saying they're putting this commission to combat police corruption and the nypd office of inspector general underneath the rubric of CCRB. Right. And yeah. police oversight doesn't mean the police overseeing other things. Well, it means well, then, oversight then I over the police. I more forward if it's the way Justine is explaining, I then I think that's forward. what it is. Okay. I think well, it's, yeah. it's oversight think, over the police will be greatly strengthened. I think that's how it I, should be. We also but I'm going to ask that as a question. Right. I think we just I think we also just need to know what those two agencies do or entities do because we have 
I don't think anybody on this in the committee knows, and I, I mean, I don't know. So we need to, but we need to get going because we have like another couple of minutes. I'm putting the community in to Comstat. Comstat, as we all know, has been a problem. It's um, what is it's statistics? You know, it's compiling. I guess is that is that it? You know, you know, Pat. The only thing it 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 can be a problem, but it also is a useful tool for certain, you know, just like they found well, well, there were certain well, train stations well, well, where there was a yeah. higher risk of, of, of Asian, anti-Asian uh, of, of violence. Well, okay, and Ned, you know, you're so, talking about that? You're talking about Comstat? Right, right. I mean, it's kind of like what, the, the idea of Comstat, which can be abused like anything, but like the officer Nelson was saying that they, they, they have some teams of, 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 of policemen going to stations where there was a spike in anti-Asian violence and that's basically what the good part of Comstat would be used, right? You know, right. so it's it's okay, not well, like a on. bad thing. It's just it, that it shouldn't be abused. Okay, let's go on and read it. So, September 2020, NYPD launched a customer service pilot in the 25th and the 113th precincts that encouraged New Yorkers to provide direct feedback about the services they received or requested. This month, New York. City will expand to this pilot program to be citywide. To further deepen this comment, uh, commitment, sorry, responding to community feedback, NYPD commanding officers will be required to begin reporting customer service and community focused metrics to strengthen and improve bonds of their communities and precincts. This is consistent with the approach to crime statistics already reported at Comstat which drives the department to commit time and resources to fighting crime. So putting the community into, I don't know what that means, putting the community into Comstat. So Comstat is the is essentially a, a data dashboard that was one of the first big kind of modernizations of, of policing in New York where they took the seven major crimes and they tabulated it across all the precincts in the city. So they could from a month to month, year over year, and inter precinct basis kind of compare patterns and different types of crimes, how they're increasing or decreasing, seasonality, and and uh, Comstat was like the essentially like the product name of it. And so it's you know like murder, assault, grand larceny, grand theft auto, you know uh, those those types of crimes, big ones. But what they're saying here is you take. Like the 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 kind of smaller community service requests, and also create a similar type of dashboard, so you can kind of track to see how those are moving. In the same way that Comstat re revolutionized the way that oh. were tracked. That that actually makes a lot of sense. You're getting it because from both putting sides. the community into Comstat didn't make any sense to me. So what it means is that they're going to. They're going to not only will they track those seven major crimes, they're now going to. They're going to track what citizens come in to report to the police. What kinds of crimes people report. Correct? Yeah, and, and yeah. 1 question that I think, you know, comes to me is. What sorts of examples are, you know, would you include in these um, community focused metrics? Like, what are sorts of requests that they would put up there? So. I think that's an easy one I can ask for the first person since they should be doing it by now, according to the timing of this is what, you know, let's see what those those are and the categories. Most of this month, I assume it's this month. It's going citywide. I, I, I guess. I mean, who knows if, if they were ready by the time the mayor announced this, but I haven't heard of anything yet. Okay. So let's go to, is this the last one here? Training to put community engagement first. Uh, before I go to the last one, was there anything else about Comstat anybody wanted to contribute? That was, I just say that, that the history, that was uh, started by this uh, officer, Jack Maple in the seventies when things were, you know, kind of getting not great in New York city. All right. Okay. Thank you, Mitch. So training to put community engagement first. Community engagement that genuinely gives people a voice in determining what public safety means to their community will be a top priority of the NYPD in 2021. And the training officers receive and the training officers receive must reflect that. Beginning this spring, New York City will expand the People's uh, Police Academy, a community led training program for local precinct personnel. Learning what public safety means to residents is integral to serving that community. That makes sense. 
Additionally, when an officer starts working in a new precinct, they will undergo an intensive course, including field training to better understand the neighborhood. They'll meet community leaders, service providers, local small business owners, and youth organizations so they can be truly embedded in the community from the start and best help their new neighbors. And that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And you know, I, Pat, that last sentence that you just read, mm -hmm. isn't that just what the cops that used to walk the beat, that, that was just part of the job naturally. Right. And, and, and that, that's what really they're trying to bring back the NCOs. So when you see a cop just pro going up and down the street in the car, car looking at you, you feel one way where like, hey, what's, what are you looking at? You know, I'm not doing nothing wrong. When the cop is going into the, you know, walking the beat and saying hello to the residents and the businesses, there's a different right. feeling. Right. Also, I thought that um, there was a proposal, and I don't know where I heard this, that the police needed to be from the city, that they needed to live in the five boroughs. Yeah, that, that's good. That, that, that I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure I agree with that 100%. And, and I do. Know. I think that there's so many people that don't know what it's like to be here and they're not interacting because it's, it's a much more um, diverse place, the city. What I would do, what I would do, Justine, what I think what they do sometimes in certain, like in, in like developments, whether it's lottery buildings or other type of elements, maybe give like police officers and fire and firemen and think people like that. Uh, like an incentive, like a, like a, like a, well, that's a or in, in the so, so that's one of the things that I keep crapping about in terms of, of trying to get, you know, affordable housing and, and multi-tiered affordable housing. Yeah, there are set asides for municipal yeah. workers. Right, right. But, but to, to tell right. people like, you, you know, the cop that lives in Long Island that gets shot like in, 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 in uh, you know, East, uh, the, you know, the Northeast Bronx, because they were trying to help somebody. The, I mean, is, he is no different than the person that's, you know, I All mean. Right. Well, we'll discuss know. this further. This is only our first round with yeah. this. It's already five after In an nine. Ideal world, that would be, you're right, Justine, that would be good. Yeah. yeah, I know everybody wants to go. So if anyone has any comments, suggestions, um, anything they want to see on the agenda for next month, please write us. And because uh, Miriama and I are going to get started early and try to get our agenda sorted out early for next month so that we can get, if there's any materials that people need to read, we can get it out early. We're trying to get there, guys. We're trying to get there. So if you have any suggestions, any topics, like Vera brought this topic to our community about the um, Asian bias and hate crimes. And so if anybody has any topics they want to bring, please let us know. Um, thank you all for attending tonight. Lucian, as always, I appreciate every single thing that you do. I do have one question for you. I don't know how we save the chat. Uh, you always want the chat? Let me see. Well, I mean, I think there there are a couple of things in the chat that we needed. I I, for, I think I emailed uh, you and Mariama um, things that were placed in the chat. Okay, great. Thank you. Now. Um, who was just asking? Taylor's had her hand up for a long time. I don't know if she still wants to speak or not. Who? Who? Taylor. Oh, I didn't know Taylor was here. Where's Taylor? She's been see. in the attendees with her hand up for a while. Oh. Hello, yeah. Taylor. Where are you? Um, hi, I don't want to keep us. Thank you so much. This has been a really um, engaging and tough meeting. And I just appreciate our community for having these conversations. And I hope we continue to have them because they're so important. We're going to try. Thanks, Taylor. Maybe I'll see you Sunday. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you again. I appreciate this committee. Everybody works hard. Everybody thinks deep. Everybody cares. So enjoy the rest of the enjoy the weekend, and uh, we'll see you at the full board meeting. Yeah. Take, thank you, Pat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Pat, we love you right back. Uh, Feel better after your shot. Oh yeah, that's great. Right. The left. She left. <laughs>